79, uh, sorry, 79 of that statement on page 18? That is correct. I'll just wait for that to come up on the screen. Uh, is the change, Mr Mendelson, to delete the date 2014 at the end of paragraph 79 and to substitute the words mid-2017? That is correct. Do you mind making that change, strike out what's wrong and put in what's right, and then if you'd be good enough to initial the uh, amendment, please, Mr Mendelson. Mr Mendelson, with that correction, are the contents of your witness statement true and correct? Yes. Commissioner, I tender the witness statement and the exhibits there too. Exhibit 1.149, witness statement of Mr Mendelson and exhibits. Thank you, Commissioner. Yes, yes, Mr Donnelly. <coughs> Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Mendelson, my name is Albert Donnelly and I'm one of the council assisting the Royal Commission. Uh, and we've just heard that your present role is the general manager of the small business bank at ANZ. That, that is right? correct. Um, and from August 2016 until October 2017, you had a position of general manager, asset finance, commercial broker and transaction banking, corporate and commercial bank. Is that correct? Yes. <clears throat> uh, and during that time, you had responsibility for ANZ's uh, response to uh, some matters concerning um, alleged contraventions of responsible lending? That is correct. <coughs> um, I'd like to first identify the issues which I would like to deal with today with you by reference to um, a response. Do you have that? The code for ANZ. Um, by reference to the ANZ. Um, response to the Commission's letter, or initial letter, I'll call that document up um, so you can see it, rcd.0001.0035 <clears throat> Have you seen this document before, Mr Mendelson? Uh, yes. So, uh, and it's a um, submission in response to the Commission's letters of the 15th of December 2017? Correct. And you're aware that in that letter from the Commission, ANZ was asked to identify um, various matters of misconduct and conduct falling below community expectations? Yes. If I can go to point zero zero three zero of that document. And you will see, consistent with uh, the issues that I'd like to um, deal with today, from 6.46 onwards, um, well, first in 6.46, there's an explanation um, of some background to the sale of the Asanda dealer finance portfolio. Um, can I pause there and ask, um, you had a number of roles um, in Asanda, if I can put it that way, I understand Asanda is a business unit of, um, or was, of ANZ, is that right? That was, that was correct, but I had never worked in the Asanda business. I see. Um, although you had uh, responsibility, uh, did you not, for um, um, asset finance? I did, finance? but that was post the sale I see. of the Asanda business to Macquarie. Uh, and, uh, uh, and in this, um, uh, notification or response to the Commission. One of the things that's um, referred to is at 6.47 that on the 18th of January 2018, ASIC commenced a civil penalty proceeding in the Federal Court against ANZ for breaches of Chapter 3 of the National Credit Act in respect of the Asanda business. Um, are you able to assist the Commission today by giving some evidence? In Absolutely. To that? Thank you. If we could just go ahead. Um, in that document to the next paragraph. In fact, on the next page. Uh, and 
we, um, one of the other issues upon which I'll ask you some questions is described in 6.51, which is following an ASIC investigation into a car finance broker, Asander agreed to remediate more than 70 customers for car loans provided by Asander. <coughs> ASIC identified that between 2011 and 2014, the broker had arranged loans for customers who did not meet Asander's lending criteria by writing the application in the name of an individual who did not own or have possession of the vehicle, but who agreed to guarantee the loan. Are you able to assist the Commission in relation to that? Yes. Well, thank you, Mr Mendelson. And if I could just um, go down slightly, uh, and in fact, there's a footnote at the bottom of that page as well. And there's also a reference to um, uh, the broker also sold add-on products such as insurance and warranties to some borrowers without their knowledge or consent. The premiums inflated the amount they borrowed, thus increasing the overall amount of interest paid by borrowers. That's another issue I'd like to ask you about. Are you able to assist? Yes. With that? Thank you. Um, at that point, Commissioner, I might seek to tender those parts of um, the ANZ response. So uh, that is just par paragraphs 6.46 to what? To 6.52. 6.52. And any footnotes there too. And th just one moment. Exhibit 1.150 will be paragraph 6.46 to 6.52 of ANZ submission in response. Uh, to Commission letters of 15 December uh, 2017, uh, RCD uh, 001-0035-003 at, uh, what are the pinpoints, uh, uh, Mr Donnelly? Uh, uh, 0030-0031. At 0030-0031. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, as I understand the position at the moment, Mr Mendelson, ANZ currently receives consumer motor vehicle finance applications from two primary sources. Is that right? That's correct. Um, and what are those sources? Uh, third party intermediaries. Yes. And through uh, our call centre directly. I see. And um, in turn, are you able to assist by um, informing the Commission as to the um, breakdown I can put it that way, the breakdown between those two um, sources of um, business for the bank. Approximately 85% through third party intermediaries and the balance through the call centre. <coughs> now I will refer to, in, in the course of some questions for you Mr Mendelson, I'll refer to the processes across the bank. Sure. But I'll focus um, in my questions on that larger part of the business, that is um, third party intermediaries. Now, am I right to say that that source involves applications from brokers or mobile lenders who have um, been accredited with ANZ to introduce consumer asset finance? That is correct. Uh, as of December uh, 16, we introduced a, uh, a training regime whereby anyone who was to sell uh, consumer asset finance had to be accredited. The accreditation process is 37, uh, well it's actually 12 mandatory modules and 37 required modules of reading and at the end of that they, they do a test, a 30 question test. There's a pool of 37 questions and to be accredited with us you have to get 100% in that test and when we launched that um, we disaccredited over 500 brokers who weren't, um, who didn't participate in that. Thank you. Um, and before oh, 100 out of about what number, uh, Mr Mendelson? Uh, at the time we had about 4,000 We net brokers in that space. So it dropped from about yep. four to three, five Correct. in round numbers. Yeah, um, but to be, to be transparent, a lot of those brokers were not brokers that we'd done very much business with. It took approximately 55 minutes to when we, to do the, the, the whole, um, uh, uh, test, so it was it was quite an impost on the brokers. We got a, quite a bit of pushback. Before that, 
Um, before that, had there been any accreditation process within the bank? Uh, uh, there had been, um, but it was one of the things that we, uh, when we sold the Asanda business, that we we looked at. We had a continuous improvement program around a series of uh, responsible lending improvements, and one of them was very much around not only training of the brokers but also training of our staff. I see, and um, the bank. Um, at around, if I can take you to the time of the sale of a Sander, that was a, about a, uh, that was about 14 months before the time you're referring to now, aren't uh, you? Well, the official date of the sale was October 15. Yes. But we worked, we still had customers as we migrated them across. So, officially, we didn't really finish until sort of April, May, the following. But year. when you referred earlier to the fact that within the bank, am I right to say that um, there was concern about? or sufficient concern that you thought an accreditation process of the type that you subsequently dis implemented needed to be put in place? Correct. And you had that concern, um, you had that concern at least around the time that Asanda was sold? Uh, and prior, uh, from an ANZ perspective, post the cash door um, uh, ASIC case, it was very clear that we needed to be very focused on enhancing our responsible lending obligations right across the board. And from that moment forward, we were working very closely. And internally, the business was working very closely with, with credit, operational and credit risk, to ensure that we were enhancing our, our controls right across things like training, monitoring, et cetera. And you said across the board, so we're talking more than uh, uh, vehicle asset finance. Are correct, we? correct. From my look, I can only talk on behalf of vehicle asset I finance. I understand that. But ANZ, um, I was a member of a Australian division-wide responsible lending uh, continuous improvement program that was uh, had representatives right across the Australian division. Yes, I see. Now, you can you place a time frame around when that. Uh, that step of having a committee in place or a... So I, when I arrived in the business, it was already in place. Okay, when did you arrive in the business? Uh, in August. I was there a little bit earlier, July 16, because I was doing a bit of a secondment. But yeah, but it was, pro it was well prior to that because it was an established forum. I, I, I could get the date, but I don't know it. Might no, no, be. That, that's okay. You can only assist us in so far as you're aware. Uh, so you arrived in the business in July 2016, some time before... Asanda, a short time before yeah. Asanda was sold, and you, is it fair to say you too formed that view that there were improvements that needed to be made in relation to ANZ's processes? As part of the handover into my role, um, it was made very clear to me that organisationally uh, we uh, needed to really be more focused on improving our controls and uh, we were focusing on that. Obviously we'd sold the Asanda business. And when we sold the Asanda business with some things that we'd identified as well. So we wanted to very much continue to participate in the industry. And we knew that if we wanted to do that, that we needed to be um, very much focused on a range of enhancements to make sure that we, um, that we, were, we were tightening our controls. And we also obviously knew that ASIC was very interested in this particular part of the industry things such as flex commissions, add-on insurances, and we did a lot of work around that as well. And uh, we'll get to those, of course. So the processes when you um, came into um, that role in about Ju July 2016, not only was it part of your handover, but there was also a view within the business that these processes were deficient and they needed to be improved. I wouldn't say there was a view in the business that we needed to enhance uh, uh, processes. Some of the issues that have arisen um, within ANZ, some of the issues that are the subject of your statement, you'd be well aware, um, were identified uh, quite some time before July 2016, weren't they? That is correct. Uh, I'm going to take you, and I, I won't refer to the names of some of the entities. Um, 
but I think yeah. you know who they are. I do. I know who they are, and perhaps we can um, refer to them in such a way that doesn't disclose their names. That's fine. Um, <coughs> but you wink twice. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. <coughs> Mendelson. Uh, in May 2014, um, there was a fraud investigation conducted by ANZ in relation to falsified pay slips, wasn't there? Correct. Um, and again, there was an issue raised in about September 2014 um, about incorrect information on applications. Are you familiar with that? Perhaps I can take you to paragraph 37 of your statement. Um, I might call it up. That might make it, if you haven't, I'll call it. You've got it there, I think. Yeah, you have your statement there, Mr Mendel. Yes, I do. Yeah, par 37. Um, and you'll see, I think in your statement, you should see the heading there, which is redacted for confidentiality. Yes, yes. Uh, I'm referring there to the fact that um, there was contact... It was in support of... The application wasn't incorrect. It was in support of... The docu OK, thank you. And I think and that was the way I asked the question. I framed the question incorrectly. Um, and that caused a ANZ fraud team, or that precipitated an ANZ fraud team investigation? That is correct. Um, one of the other issues that we'll come to um, is on the next page, which concerns a different uh, dealer. So just to be very clear, the, the first two were brokers? Yes. And the third one was a dealer? Yes. The first uh, two had Australian credit licences. Correct. But the um, one I'm about to take you to was a dealer. Correct. But they all fit broadly, if I can say, into this 85% of the... Well, technically, in that 85%, there are no dealers because we've sold the business. Yes, I understand. That's the current position, but at the Correct. relevant time... At the relevant time, the dealer business was much larger than the third-party intermediary business. Yes. Um, and all I'm identifying is relevantly when certain things came to the bank's um, attention. But in May 2015, uh, an issue came to the bank's attention from a different source, again, about um, falsified pay slips. Correct. And your evidence uh, was that as of December 2016, a new training regime was implemented. Correct. Um, there seems, I mean, it's fair to say that quite a bit of time elapsed before, before the identification of these issues in 2014 and the ultimate implementation of a, a system to improve the processes two years later. So I'd, I'd just like to be clear that that training program is not solely focused on detecting payslip fraud. That is a much broader set of, it includes you know, when you meet the customer and going through income. Except that. Uh, so that was part of... In regards to uh, payslip fraud, we have um, a, a series of initiatives that we have implemented. Um, the challenge with payslip... At the time, we had training um, for our assessment staff and for our um, fulfilment staff or our settlement staff to identify... Um, what not only fraudulent pay slips look like, but fraudulent bank, stips, uh, bank statements, etc. And it's something that we continue to enhance. And those staff today have to, on a quarterly basis, do at least an hour training around that. So we continue to enhance that. We have um, continued to enhance our fraud detection system, which is an at the application process. Um, we have, um, inc we've, we've boosted since this occurred the number of staff in our fraud team. We have um, also um, improved the way that our collections team can identify fraud when they're investigating it. So there is no silver bullet to detecting payslip fraud, but we have made a series of changes since you, these incidents occurred. You'd accept that the processes were deficient back in May 2015 though, wouldn't you? Yes. Um, and over time, and we can explore it, but over time you'd say that those processes have improved? Correct. Can you give me some estimate of frequency or uh, uh, anything that will give me some sure. feel for the size of the problem? Yeah, so we had 50,000 applications last year. Uh, we had less... We detected... The data is a little bit... It, there's different phases of it, but it's under 
point one of a percent. So we had. It is absolutely an issue. Um, fraud in general for the bank is a major focus area, be it cyber fraud, be it payslip fraud, be it bank statement fraud. Um, we're seeing even things like um, something called salary staging, which is where um, people who are trying to defraud the bank will set up bank accounts and create legitimate statements, putting money in and out, and then presenting those. Um, the level of sophistication in payslip fraud is improving um, regularly. So um, I couldn't sit here and tell you that there's any way um, that we could 100% um, guarantee that there would not be payslip fraud. I could ring, if, if we were to ring every employer, I could say I work for ANZ and I could get my friend in the cubicle next to me, give them their number and say do you work for ANZ. It's just, a, it's part of doing business. It's something that we have an incredible focus on. Um, but as I said, the level of sophistication, we go from very unsophisticated to organised crime in this part of... I understand that and um, human systems are human systems. But just to try and get some sense of, of, of size, uh, at the moment you're talking about if it's 0.1%, 50 out of 50,000? So, uh, yeah. Is it? Yeah, the, the, look, the, the data, because it happens at different stages, it's no greater than 100, yes. and it's no less than 50. Yeah. yeah. Not On the data that I was... Precise number. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's yeah. yeah. Because we, when we also detect it at different stages. Sure. But obviously we've been through a long process with the regulator, and we take that our responsible lending obligations very seriously, and um, we are doing everything in our power to ensure that this doesn't happen. Okay. Yet with, with all those changes that you've made sitting here now though, can you, uh, can you say that the relevant processes that are in place are sufficient to discharge those, those obligations? As I said, they've improved, but I can't. Can you say that they're sufficient to discharge those obligations? I don't know what the definition of sufficient is. Well, you're aware of what the responsible lending obligations on the bank Absolutely. are, aren't you? Absolutely. And part of that is the reasonable verification of, um, of a customer's financial circumstances. Correct. You're aware of that? Correct. And part of reasonable verification is things such as, and we'll come to other aspects, but clearly income is one of those. Absolutely. And can you tell me with, that the processes as at today are sufficient to discharge ANZ's responsibilities in that regard? Oh, I don't feel qualified to answer that question. Well, you're in a very senior role. If uh, in we are banking best issue. endeavours, but as I've just explained, uh, you know, if someone is staging, uh, you know, bank statements and pay slips, uh, I'm not uh, asking you for a guarantee, Mr. Mendelson. I know well, then I would say yes. Prior to the sale, um, why did, sorry if I can go back, you, in your evidence you describe why um, ANZ sold its Asanda business. Were you part of that decision? No. We, are you aware why um, ANZ um, sold its Asanda business? Yeah, it, yes I am. And why did it? Uh, it was part of a, it's part of a, 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 a a scope of work to simplify the bank. Um, ANZ had a series of businesses that were not considered to be core, and that included um, the dealer finance business. Um, it's obviously it's included um, exiting certain businesses in uh, in Asia. Um, it's included um, our wealth business. It's part of a, 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 as, a as I said a, a, a bank wide program to simplify the bank, and also it's related to. Um, dealing into the new capital requirements that the bank needs. Did it have anything to do with the fact that a Sander couldn't discharge properly its responsible lending obligations, Mr Mendelson? Not that I'm aware of. What's the basis for your, um, what's the basis for your understanding of why that part of the business was sold? As I just explained, that um, it was considered not to be a core. Now, what's the basis for that? 
on what basis do you say oh, that? Um, on what I've been informed and, um, and also it's a well known and articulated um, strategy that uh, that we talk about both internally and externally. In your statement, you make very clear that when you give that answer, you say these announcements, I'm, I'm taking you to paragraph 17 in fairness to you, um, and I might take you back actually to um, paragraph 16 to give you the context. You say, I have reviewed the announcements made to ANZ to the ASX on 4 May 2015 and 8 October 2015. I pre previously referred to the 8 October date, yeah. um, and I think in an earlier part of your statement you referred to that um, announcement. Uh, then you go on to, having identified those two, you then go on to say at 17, these announcements reveal that ANZ sold a Santa distrib dealer distribution business as part of a broader priority by ANZ to manage its portfolio of businesses to ensure it used capital efficiently and as part of a focus upon ANZ branded products and its core business. You see that? Correct. You're very careful there to say that you're relying on the announcements, aren't you, Mr Mendelson? Well, as I said, I didn't work in the business. I, w I, I arrived in when the business had been sold. So it's just to be clear, your evidence is, as far as you are aware, that none of these responsible lending issues were a cause, were a factor in the sale of a Sander by ANZ. Is that clear? Clear, yes. Now, your evidence and I'm taking you back, and I understand you weren't in the business, but you obviously know or um, have been put forward by ANZ as someone who can give evidence on these issues, and you explain it in your witness statement that the Asanda business accounted for approximately 3% of ANZ's net lending assets? That's correct. Um, and you explain the different divisions through, through which it um, operated? Correct. More specifically, you go on to say that consumer motor vehicle asset finance arranged through brokers and dealers in the Asanda business comprised 1.5% of ANZ's total net lending assets. Of the Australian division. Of the Australian division, sorry, thank you. Um, was, are you able to assist the Commission by inf informing it as to how large that is in monetary terms? Uh, in the statement, from memory, we sold circa eight billion dollars of lending assets to in the dealer business, which would have incorporated that part as well as the other parts. Is that correct? No, it was the dealer, the dealer component, and then we retained the other component, which is the broker and the uh, uh, the uh, the call centre component. Um, so, which is circa two and a half billion dollars worth. I see. So the, so the majority of the business was in the dealer business. Yeah, and that's the one that was sold. Correct. Um, and that was sold because, on your evidence, to manage a portfolio of business um, and to focus upon ANZ branded products. Correct. Now, <clears throat> at that, it, when a Sander was in business as part of the ANZ business, um, your evidence is that the dealer distribution channel would use the services of ANZ um, relevantly in two ways. It would use the operations group for credit assessment, is that right? Correct. And settlement, yes. fraud invest fraud yes. collection, and group functions for credit risk, product management, those sort of roles, is that, that right? That is correct. That was after 2009 when it became incorporated. Prior to that, it was a standalone business. Okay, thank you. Um, I've got enough to deal with. We won't go back to this before 2001. Just want to be clear with the Commission. Thank you. Uh, and your statement, what we've asked you to focus on, and what I'll ask you about, although we will deal, of course, with the processes after, um, in terms of changes that have occurred, is predominantly the process, um, the processing of applications between about one, or from 1 January 2011 to 31 December 2015, that period. Correct. Um, as I understand um, that 
process, and we'll come to it in a little bit more detail, but you say at paragraph 19 that consumer motor vehicle asset finance applications were received by ANZ via the completion of an electronic application form contained within the Asanda lending system? Correct. Um, and that's known, that's known internally, is it as ELS? Correct. Um, and when the business was sold, ELS still continues to be used, though, as I understand Correct. it. Correct. Uh, in the sale, um, Macquarie elected not to take our system, okay. and we continue to use ELS. Um, so the same system that was being used at the time of Asanda to evaluate applications for finance is the same system that is being used by... For consumer asset finance, correct. Thank you. Can I deal with the relationship between dealers and a sander? And I'm referring to the relevant period here. And I'll take you to a document um, by reference to which I'd like to ask you some questions. Sure. The document will come up on your screen as ANZ.017.001.2571. Now this letter was um, written to a Sander accredited dealers. Was the term accredited used within the business even before the processes which you've referred to in 2016? In December 2016, you've said that there is a new oh, you've um, been a part of. It would have, it's, a, it's a term, but the definition of accredited changed. But again, this is related to their accreditation as, as a dealer with with a sander, not the training of staff per se. Yes. Uh, you, what you referred to later, you put in the context of accreditation because the training is required to be accredited. Accredited with us. Correct. And that training that now is given to dealers um, is different, very different, you would say, to that which yeah, was Yeah, and just to be clear, to brokers, not to dealers, because yes. we don't deal with dealers. Yes, I understand that. Uh, and this document um, appears to be a communication to, uh, to the dealers um, within the Asanda network um, in, on the 5th of December 2014. Correct. I assume it was quite common for Asanda to communicate with its dealers. Correct. Um, to give them information about their relationship, whether it be financial matters, whether it be regulatory matters, Correct. Uh, and other matters. And training as well. Thank you. Now this document uh, is, um, says at the very start in the first paragraph that, um, if you go halfway through the first paragraph, it says, well, maybe I'll just uh, deal with the, the purposes of it. Part of the internal proce procedures at Asanda were um, in relation to on our ongoing obligations and responsibilities under Act. We are writing to remind you of your key obligations as our representative. This communication requires your attention and, and, ac um, and action to enable your dealerships to continue to introduce business to Asanda that is regulated by the Act. We require you and all employees and contractors that have access to the Asanda system to re read this communication, complete the acknowledge, attached acknowledgement form, return it to us by 16 January. Please note that this communication has changed since it was last issued in November 2013. Now, you weren't there in Asanda at the relevant time, um, but um, can you explain, um, and presumably you do this sort of thing with brokers now, the purpose of writing in those terms to um, the dealers? Uh, look, I've reviewed this uh, document in preparation of today. Um, the intent of it was to ensure that they understood what their responsibilities were. Um, uh, but we, uh, in regards to brokers, we wouldn't be writing a letter like this because they have their own ACL 
Um, at, but we do, as with brokers, as part of ongoing communications with them at professional development days, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, constantly educate and remind them of of, of their responsibilities. Um, so, so, so what we what were a Sanders. How would you describe a Sanders' obligations under the National Credit Act as at 5 December 2014? Look, I, I, I don't feel very equipped to answer that question because I wasn't in the business, but obviously they were running a deal of business under a, a point of sale exemption and uh, they were um, organisationally already, as I said at that time, there was a, a much tighter focus on responsible lending obligations and the intent of this document from my, again I wasn't in the business, but would be to remind regardless of point of sale obligation or not, everybody's responsibility in doing the right thing by customers. Um, because dealers were subject to an exemption, weren't they? Correct. So dealers, because they were selling goods or services at the point of sale, Dealers weren't um, the subject of the National Credit Act, were they? Correct. But Asanda was. Correct. This letter says, amongst other things, that the dealer was there as your representative. Correct. Yeah. When you say that, when the letter describes the um, dealer as ANZ's representative, did that mean that it was, uh, that a Sander um, required uh, the, the dealer to do um, certain things as part of the sale that complied with responsible lending? That's is right, that right? This lend this, this what the intent of this letter was. If one goes to point two seven five, sorry, point two five seven four. There's a heading, your key obligations as our representative under the Act. The Commissioner asked you about representative. Is there any other explanation you can give for the, the business operated for that? as was explained yesterday exactly in the same way by Westpac? Thank you. You told dealers that they had to advise consumers that of your, your role being a dealer's role as a representative of a Sanda. Do you see that? Yes. Um, and you, if I can say you, I'm referring to the business, of course, Mr Mendelson. You are required to obtain from every consumer that you provide credit assistance to in respect of quotes, applications, contracts with Asanda, a signed statement acknowledging that you are our representative under the Act. Do you see that? Yes. And that was conveying to um, consumers that when they were dealing with Asanda, they were dealing with the, the person on the ground, that is the, the business manager at the dealer. Yes. Now, we'll come to the actual um, Asanda representative statement in a moment. Um, but if you go down to, uh, sorry, I'm going to come in a little bit more detail to remuneration, but I just want to ask about one thing. Um, there was a dealer rem origination fee, wasn't there, that was part of any car loan, the subject of an Asanda um, loan. Yes. Uh, and I'm not asking you to know with specificity, but approximately how much would a dealer origination fee be? I, I can't comment because I don't know. In the hundreds I, of dollars? Uh, I, I, I generally don't know. Okay. The, uh, and who um, whose decision was it whether or not to charge a dealer origination fee? The uh, business manager. Uh, and, um, and were consumers informed of that? I can't, I, I don't know, I can't comment. You go down to um, point C on this page. Um, 
if you choose to charge a dealer origination fee to a consumer, it's entirely your responsibility to explain this fee to the consumer. Do you see that? Yes. Um, it then says, under no circumstances must any indication be given to the consumer by any means that this fee is in any way related to a sander. Do you see that? Correct. Why was a sander telling its dealers to say that? Uh, look, I, I'm not in the detail of it, but again, it's a dealer origination fee. It's not an Asanda origination fee. It was a paid for generally out of the um, the amount of the car loan. That yeah, was it could be yes, could be or it was. Well, it depended on each individual. True. Um, in your experience, was it commonly an amount which was added to the car loan? Again, I don't have specific experience in this business, but I would assume so. Thank you. <clears throat> so, as at December 2014, uh, Asanda obviously communicated with its dealers by way of this letter. Mm -hmm. Did Asanda, in so doing, expect the obligations? under the National Credit Act to be performed by the dealers? Look, I, I know this is frustrating, but I didn't work in the business. <laughs> so the people who worked in the business no longer work for the bank. Um, this letter was sent asking the dealers to read it and acknowledge that they understood it. So I don't know what you infer by that to answer that question. Um, I wasn't responsible for sending the letter out or what the background to it was, but the, you, the, the letter clearly uh, is trying to make dealers aware of what their obligations are in a Sanders, from Can a Sanders perspective. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you yeah, off. Sorry. No, you finish. No, no, I'm finished. <laughs> sorry, I did cut you off. Um, Can I come at the problem this way? Uh, the letter was reminding dealers of their obligations to ANZ, is that right? Correct. And dealers complying with their obligations to ANZ was necessary if ANZ was to comply with its obligations under the Act. Would you agree with that? Correct. Now, I just want to focus on the was necessary uh, operator in that uh, proposition. Compliance by dealers with their obligations was absolutely essential if ANZ was to uh, meet its obligations. Is that putting it too highly? It seems to me to follow, but... but uh, again, it's, <coughs> it's not my area of expertise because I never worked in this business and I don't understand the nuance between point of sale exemption and... And, and being the, the, the uh, ACL, but my, my inference from this letter is that's absolutely right. And my inference from this letter is that we, even if it was, we were trying to almost retrofit a little bit more than potentially what was the requirement under being a point of sale exemption uh, provider. But uh, yeah, absolutely, ANZ is ultimately responsible as the credit provider. And a, a necessary link in the Correct. chain was that the dealer did what they should. Absolutely. And this was reminding them, Correct. here's what you've got to do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's just that I'm not a detailed expert in the law. Understand that, Mr Mendelson. I'm trying to get a business perspective yeah. on No, that. absolutely. From a business perspective, the intent would have been that we would want to make sure that we were very clear with our dealers what our expectations were and that they were doing the right thing by customers and this letter asked them to read it and sign it and return it by a particular day. Yes. So you accept, of course, that uh, uh, Sandra at the relevant time could not subcontract out in any way of its obligations under the Na National Credit Act? No. 
Um, and in fact, if there was, um, do, you, do you also accept that if there was any failure to comply with the National Credit Act that by a sander, that was something that fell at the feet of a sander and not the dealer? Correct. Now, I know you didn't write this letter and you've said that, and I understand you weren't in the business um, at the time, but if one goes ahead to the next page, Um, and to point F towards the bottom. And I'm asking for your perspective as a uh, very experienced businessman in looking at these, not as the person who wrote these letters, but it says there as our representative, when providing credit a system for exempted transactions, that is open brackets, under the point of sale exemption, you are responsible for ensuring that all our <coughs> that all our requirements of you, as detailed in this communication, existing arrangements between us are met at all times. You see that? Yes. Then it goes on to say failure to comply with these requirements that give rise to any cost or loss to a sander and ANZ will result in the cost or loss being charged to you in full together with all on costs incurred by a sander and ANZ. Do you see that? Yes. An equally open reading of that paragraph, Mr Mendelssohn, is in fact that ANZ was saying, we expect you dealers to make sure everything is done to ensure compliance with the responsible lending obligations. To be quite honest, I'm not 100% sure, sure how to read that paragraph. It's very ambiguous. I'm, I'm, I'm not being difficult. No, I, no, I no, just, no, no. It's just I'm not 100% sure how to read that paragraph. My question to you is simply whether or not it was one reading of it was simply, we ANZ are telling you, you go and make sure that there's compliance with responsible lending obligations, that's on you, and if we suffer any loss because it doesn't happen, we're coming to you. I think that is one way you could read it. I think the intent of that would be to say that we take this very seriously and if you don't, we will. there could be ramifications for you. I see. But I just want to be clear, I don't think it's passing on the responsibility. It's more about, I think the intent of that would be showing more about how seriously we're taking their, their, their role in the, in the process. <coughs> but again, I, that's just my view on it. It might be said though that there was, at this time, and I know things have changed, and I understand the nature of the business, but it's certainly around December 2014, there was an expectation within ANZ, Asanda specifically, that responsible lending obligations were a problem for the dealer, not for ANZ. No, I, 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 I just can't answer that question. Um, you know, again, from my experience of working at ANZ, it, it's not about passing on our obligation. It's making sure that we're trying to do the right thing by the customer. And in this case, we were dealing with uh, an intermediary being the, uh, the dealer network and, 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 and being attempting to be clear about them about what we, our expectations were. If you go to Appendix A to that letter, which is two pages later, I've already referred to this because this is um, the doc document that was referred to um, a moment ago where um, you informed the dealers that they had to sign this document. Yes. Uh, and by this document, you um, required um, a Sander representatives to um, confirm with each applicant for finance um, these matters. I confirm the dealer has advised me that the dealer is acting as a representative of a Sander. See there? Yes. Um, yeah, division of ANZ, and then in this capacity is assisting me to apply for credit with a Sander. The dealer is not acting on my behalf as my agent in connection with the finance and does not owe me 
any duties in respect of the finance? Do you see that? Yes. And any origination fee charged to me by the dealer relates to the dealer's administration of my application? Do you see that? Yes. Mr Mendelson, are you aware, and I'm not make, seeking to turn this into a, a law class, but are you aware of the obligations of a sander at the relevant time in ANZ generally to, amongst other things, do all things necessary to ensure that credit activities authorised by its licence are engaged in efficiently, honestly and fairly? Are you aware of that? I'm aware of that, yes. Um, and are you aware that there also has to be in place um, adequate arrangements to ensure that clients of the licensee, so here, if I can just pausing there, a client of the licensee is the person who walks into the dealer, isn't it? Correct. The client of the licensee are not disadvantaged by any conflict of interest that may arise wholly or partly in relation to credit activities engaged in by the licensee or its representatives? Correct. So there's an obligation on ANZ, isn't there, to uh, have in place adequate arrangements to ensure that clients and not disadvantaged? Yes. And was this an attempt to, was this an attempt by ANZ to satisfy that obligation, was it? Look, look I'm, I can't comment because I don't know what the intent of this was. Well, what you can tell me is that it refers to an origination fee, doesn't it? Yes. Does it refer to any of the other, um, the other, Commissions that were obtained by the dealer in the course of uh, in the course of negotiating a car loan with uh, with the, the customer. No. Uh, Commissioner, can I tender that document, <coughs> which is that will be uh, Exhibit Point One uh, One Point One Five One. Circular letter Asanda to accredited dealers, 5 December 2014, ANZ uh, 017, uh, 0012571. Yes. It might be 001 just for the purposes of the transcript, Commissioner. Yeah. One too many zeros. You're right. It's zero one seven double zero one two five seven one. You you recall that in your and that can come down uh, now. Um, you recall in your statement um, you dealt with uh, amongst other issues. Or you were, sorry, I withdraw that. You were asked to consider in your um, witness statement um, issues um, relating to um, KPIs. Yes. What, what is a KPI? Key performance indicator. I see. And um, by um, question four, which um, I, I won't take you to it, but um, the, the Commission asked you and you provided a statement which was to describe the incentives and key performance indicators for intermediaries or groups of intermediaries during the relevant period by reason of the initiation and approval of a car loan and any add-on products such as insurance or warranties in respect of a car loan. You exhibit any relevant documents that set out those incentives or KPIs? Yes, see that. Are there any documents that set out those incentives or KPIs? Uh, there were uh, contracts with dealers that we, I'm sure, we provided. Did you exhibit them to your statement? No. Um, you say in your evidence that 
ANZ paid accredited third party intermediaries who introduced a SANDA car loans commissions calculated by reference to the number and volume of loan applications in introduced? Correct. Now, in your evidence, you then um, gave um, um, or, or went through um, those three different um, forms of remuneration, a fixed amount payable in respect of each loan contract introduced. Correct. Um, a percentage of revenue associated with the extent to which the loan contract was written at an interest rate in excess of ANZ's nominated base interest rate, but less than the ANZ nominated cap or maximum. Correct. Now that's known as flex commission. Correct. And you know that I'll be asking you a few questions about that. Then the third type of um, payment is a volume bonus incentive. Correct. Yes, can I interrupt you, Mr. Dinelli, and say to both council that I would be assisted if, uh, uh, before Mr. Mendelssohn leaves the box, if it's possible, uh, I could be taken to uh, a contract, a dealer contract, presumably, uh, that can be regarded as a typical, uh, or containing a typical provision about remuneration. We'll take that on notice. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, yeah, taking on notice is one thing, doing it's another, <laughs> Mr. Dr. Collins. Uh, as I say, it'll be helpful if uh, I can have access to it before Mr. Mendelssohn leaves the box. If it can't happen, it can't happen, I know. But can we see what we can do? I meant short notice, of course. <laughs> <laughs> you've had it, Dr. Collins, you've had the short notice. Yeah, do go on, Mr. Donnelly. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, can you explain, for the benefit of the Commission, although this issue has arisen, but your understanding of a flex commission? Sure. So uh, there is a base rate which uh, the bank sets, uh, and then uh, that is provided to uh, the intermediary. Um, that base rate then, uh, the way that ANZ operated, uh, allowed what was called an over, allowed the uh, Broker, uh, the business manager or the broker then to uh, uh, charge an amount above that base rate. Um, we did. We have always had caps on that, and um, and yeah, that's how fundamentally flex commissions worked. Thank you. Um, and ANZ worked or work now. Uh, in ANZ, um, we changed it in December to uh, seventeen. And what was the change in...? Uh, we have adopted uh, ASIC's recommendation and put it to market. So in, when You're going to have to explain... Okay, so um, when I arrived in the... Slow. Yeah, no, in 2016 we, un we knew that ASIC was looking at this and we undertook a, a, a quite an extensive review and we wanted to make sure there was a balanced outcome between um, the intermediary, the customer and the bank and we had a, 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 a working document that had come up with what we thought would, would work for us. Uh, and um, we were also obviously awaiting ASIC's um, engagement around what their findings were. Uh, our findings and their findings were relatively similar. So ASIC's finding now is that there is a published customer rate, um, which we adopted in December 17 and the intermediary has the opportunity to discount that down to the base rate. But the customer rate is what the published rate is, and then also that there is a fixed dollar amount that is paid to the broker, and we adopted that in December 17. I see. But again, to be really clear, we adopted that in only in the broker business because we don't operate a, a dealer business anymore. Um, can I explore with you the, some of the elements of the answer you gave me in, yes. this, in relation to the meaning of a flex commission? Yes. You said, and obviously I'm dealing with the relevant period, That's as I call no, it. That's fine. I understand, you, understand that. 2011-2015. Um, um, did ANZ have a... That 
period. That yes. is a cap on the maximum that could be Im Correct. Im imposed. Um, what was... 8%. Okay. And it, is that the overs that you're Correct. referring to? the overs. Okay, so the base rate would have changed, I imagine, over that relevant Correct. period. Um, but can you assist the Commission just roughly what was the base rate? Uh, we had a pricing model for risk and it it was, depending on the customer, sort of um, from the information that I've seen was somewhere circa 6% um, to 16%. I see. Um, but the base rate, your evidence was that, um, that ANZ had a nominated um, I'm sorry, that ANZ had a nominated base interest rate. Was that the same for all customers? No. no. So when did the dealer, when was the dealer informed of the ANZ's nominated base? Uh, there were sorry. published base rates uh, that changed. I, I don't know the specific. Um, the base rate really includes the cost of the money and, and, and certain risk elements. So as those things would change, we would change the base rate. And whatever was the base rate for that, whatever it might have been, Correct. from 6 to 16%, and 6% would presumably be if you if there was... Less risk. Very low risk. Correct. 16% would be a very high risk. Correct. But whatever it was, the dealer, in his or her discretion, was able to negotiate with the customer to impose a further... or to Yes. ..to yes. Um, agree a further 8%, is that right? Uh, eight, uh, dependent on the customer. It was a, it, um, in the information that we supplied around our pricing uh, at that time, uh, we had a different range. Um, so it was some, some customers was up to 4%, but the maximum was 8%. Thank you. And, <clears throat> and if I walked into the dealer during the relevant period and bought my car and whether it be 4% or 8% or um, was added to the ANZ base rate, what benefit did um, yeah, what benefit did ANZ receive from that? Uh, we took a percentage of that over. Okay, and what was the percentage that? Uh, uh, look, it, it was a negotiated um, percentage, but it could be anywhere, from my understanding, it was anywhere from 40 to 60%. Uh, and the dealer, the dealer also got a percentage of that, or the remainder, I yes, assume. Yes, it was um, a share arrangement. And so on your evidence, it must be that the dealer would get between 40 and 60%. Correct. Some of the, um, some of the work done by ANZ identified that dealers would get up to 80% of that. As I said, there were different negotiations, depending on the dealer, there was no, um, from my understanding, there was no standard. I understand. Um, but on your evidence, it was um, between 40 and 60%. But that, uh, that was the average. As I said, there were there are particular dealers where I know that it was higher. But again, I've, I've just, I don't know the specifics if, of it. If I can ask you, obviously, to answer the question as best you can, but would a very um, profitable dealer, that is a dealer that gave a lot of business to a sander, would that have a higher amount of the um, flex commission than perhaps one that didn't do as much business as a general matter? As a general, that's my understanding, yes. And you said there was between 40 and 60 might have been the average, but it may have been higher than that? Correct. There were instances where that was higher. Now, you said that you had done, you, ANZ, had done some work, um, and I understand that you no longer have the ANZ business, uh, the Asanda business, but the same, as I think your evidence is that the same model applied to brokers? Correct. So you had done some work around the time, and, I, and ASIC was looking at this issue of flex commissions for a long time, as you know, or for Correct. a period of time. And ASIC explained um, some key findings that it obtained, and I'll come to those, but what was the, um, and this is the period before you made this decision, um, and I'll ask you to turn your mind to perhaps a time when they were still imposed, so it might be mid-2017, what were the sort of concerns that ANZ had about flex commissions? Uh, transparency. 
fundamentally. Um, Can you tell me a bit more about that? Uh, that the what do you mean by uh, yeah, sure. So that the customer did not um, understand the the arrangement of they were presented a rate, but they didn't understand how that rate was um, being constructed, and on and obviously who was keeping what because the inference would be that that was what the bank was charging I see. and keeping. Um, you don't descend to this level of detail, it's not a criticism, in your statement, but do, are you able to assist the Commission in identifying um, whether as a percentage or just as a general proposition um, what the rates were that dealers agreed with customers relative to whether or not it was the base rate or the uh, what you describe as the, oh, uh, the, the maximum? Uh, look, I don't have any empirical evidence, um, but I generally they uh, I can't really comment because um, I, I don't know, um, but they would go generally to the midpoint, but obviously some would always go to the high point. Yes. And it's something that was monitored, but... And one of the concerns that you said was around transparency, but if we can just delve a little bit deeper into that. I mean, it, clearly this gives an incentive, doesn't it, for the dealer with whom Sandra at the relevant time was dealing to increase the price of the credit contract in a way that doesn't actually relate to the sort of considerations that ANZ had in mind, that is about credit risk. Correct. And it also has uh, the not only does it not consider relevant risk, but it also uh, is determined perhaps, and I'll ask if this is in your experience, by nature of the financial sophistication or degree of literacy or capacity to negotiate of the customer? That could be the case, yes. Well, obviously within ANZ a decision was made um, in December 2017 uh, to stop um, these flex commissions, so far as brokers are concerned. Um, if I could just make a point, though, um, I, 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 I accept the premise that you're coming from, um, but w part of what we did is we had different base rates for different parts of the marketplace, and we got out of those marketplaces because the risk-based pricing approach was not working. So the premise that you have a high quality customer because we had a tiered model and we still do, still works in the sense that their sophistication may be higher. But I do accept your point because the base rate is based on, on a customer profile, not so the when we were in uh, a, a, a very detailed, we wanted to participate in all parts of the car market in the day and we, we were, uh, and in one of the documents that we furnished, um, we were we 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 were pricing for risk, and that did not work. So we got out of that. Just while you're interrupted, uh, you said the base rate during the relevant period varied. Yes. Sort of six to sixteen was yes. the range you yes. gave, and you spoke of the overs as varying between four to eight. Correct. Now. Uh, what I wanted to know is uh, how the four to eight related to the six to 16. Should I be thinking in terms of a range of 14 to 20, or should I be thinking in terms of a range of 10 to 24? Do you understand the- I understand very the, clearly. The I've just done? Yes. Uh, what, which is the- The latter. So the 10 to 24. 10 to 24. So the higher risk customer uh, assessed at a base rate of 16 uh, might be open to uh, a flex commission 
uh, in respect of uh, calculated at a further eight percentage points, so up to 24% rate. Yes. <clears throat> And did the customer know anything about that? They just knew what the rate was. In your experience, how common, if at all, would it be that um, the over would be less than 4%? Uh, look, I, I can't comment because I, I don't know. Because I wasn't, I don't have that information because I wasn't in the business at the time. There would be occasions where it would be under, but I, I just, I just, um, the thing with, no, I, can't, I just can't comment. I don't, don't want you, of course, to speculate at all. Um, but if I can just summarise then. Um, what we've um, where where we've got to is that flex flex commissions were used during the entirety of the relevant period. Yes, uh, and the decision by ANZ in December two thousand and seventeen to remove flex commissions was made having regard to the same sort of considerations that those were raised by ASIC. Correct. That was that informed us. Um, we ought to be transparent again. We did some financial analysis as well, but um, we knew that ASIC was we were in, we were part of the con industry consultation with them around flex, uh, and uh, the reason that we were able to launch before the November one of the reasons we were able to launch before the November 18 requirement was that we basically um, had a gr had come up with the same way and we were already working about how to implement that anyway um, in our systems. When you say you'd come up with the same way, are you... We wanted to, we were very clear to have a, um, a transparent customer rate that could not be inflated and if the, if the um, intermediary wanted to deflate it, that was at their discretion and, then, um, and that could be um, so we just wanted to, again, to make sure that that was very clear to the customer. And, I mean, in, in many ways, it, it's fair to say it's a complete opposite of a flex commission. Correct. Before that change, did the intermediary have a conflict of interest? Yes. What did Asanda do to manage that conflict of interest or address it? Uh, it, it had uh, a series of, to the best of my knowledge, what I've been told is it had a series of reporting of particular intermediaries that were constantly at the top end of those base rates and they would, they would monitor that. Um, I'm not aware of any dealers ever being, you know, disaccredited because of practices, but it may have been the case during that course of the, expect, uh, the period. One of the questions I might have to look at is the adequacy of the arrangements that were in place to uh, ensure that clients of Asanda were not disadvantaged by that conflict of interest. Now, uh, it therefore may be important uh, to know what, if any, were the steps that Asanda had taken to deal with, is the most neutral term I can think of, to deal with the fact that there was this conflict of interest. Is there anything in the evidence that you've given Mr Mendelson that um, assist in identifying any steps that were taken in that regard? No.
Can I move to um, another aspect of um, remuneration, um, and it's this. In your statement, you deal with um, the fact that some third party intermediaries sold um, insurance marketed under the Asanda brand and obtained a commission directly from Alliance, from Alliance being the insurance company as a result of that sale. You aware of that? Yes. So what can you explain for um, the benefit of um, the commission what sort of insurance that was? Uh, at the time it was a series of insurances that included um, tire and rim, uh, curbside insurance, uh, gap insurance, comprehensive car insurance, those types of insurance products. It's the curbside that I don't think I'm conscious of. What's that? Uh, uh, if uh, your car breaks down, like the RACV. I see. So tire and rim, curbside, gap and comprehensive? Uh, there were seven. I don't know them all off the yeah. top of my head. For present purposes, I'm interested in this aspect of it. Um, you're aware that um, a sander, sorry, withdraw that. You're aware that the dealers were selling as part of the car loan transaction, the car transaction, which incorporated the car loan, um, various of these insurance products to the customer. Yes. And in relation to the sale of those, they would then be items that would commonly be this part of the loan that a sander would um, make to the customer to purchase the car and included in that the add-on insurance. Correct. And in relation to that um, insurance, did you, well, you weren't there at the relevant time, but um, was there um, a, any concern that you're aware of expressed by um, a Sander in relation to the, the value of those types of insurance? So could you ask that question what, again? Was there any concern about the value of those types of insurance to the customer? During this period? Yes. I, I, I wasn't in the business, so I couldn't comment. Um, are you aware that um, uh, add-on insurance has um, been an issue um, that has been raised by a number of um, bodies and individuals um, in relation to the car loan industry? Yes. Um, are you familiar, as it sounds like um, you may be, of various evidence that's been given in this commission? Correct. And you will... Um, know that Ms Karen Cox, the Financial Rights Legal Centre, gave evidence um, last week in relation to, in part, the issue of add-on insurance? Correct. Um, and you're aware also that add-on insurance has been the subject of, um, or the focus of ASIC's attention? Yes, and to be really clear, we were, again, we've done a full review of that and we now only sell two insurance products and that is the comprehensive car insurance and the loan protection insurance. Sorry, and the... Loan protection loan insurance. Protection. Why don't you sell... Uh, we did a full review of all the insurance products that we were selling post the sale of Asanda and the claim rates on the remaining insurance products that we had were nowhere near um, an acceptable level or an industry level, so we decided to withdraw from that part of the okay. business. Thank you. So the claim rates were not acceptable. What do you mean by that? Uh, there are, uh, again, I'm not an insurance specialist, um, but there are industry um, averages and we weren't achieving those, so therefore we, we decided not to participate in that, selling those insurance products. Uh, do I understand that as meaning that the premiums paid uh, were larger than... Uh, yeah, and fundamentally customers weren't claim claiming... Yeah. Yeah. Can you assist me again in terms of a, a time frame for when ANZ yeah, made uh, We did that uh, in April 16. Um, and 
the sorts of insurance, I am putting this at a high level, but the sorts of insurance that are no longer sold are tyre and rim insurance, Correct. the curbside insurance, Correct. the ones that you refer Correct. to. We just sell the insurance for the car and to protect them against if something happens during the loan period. Yes. Um, so no doubt you're familiar with a report that the, final, the report to which I'm about to refer, um, is, it was preceded by other inquiries, but um, ASIC did a report in 2017, Report 292, a market that is failing consumers the sale of add-on insurance through car dealers. You're familiar with that? Sorry, could you repeat that? Sorry. Report 292, a market that is failing consumers the sale of add-on insurance through car dealers. I don't know what... Sorry. ASIC. An ASIC report. Oh, uh, I'm not specifically aware of that report, but I'm very well versed in the challenges and and as I said, uh, when I arrived in the business, the analysis had been completed and we were in the process of rolling. That's right, because yeah. April 2000. Yeah, oh, right. yeah we, were, we were well into not selling those products any longer. Can you tell me what sorts of numbers were being shown by the analyses that have been done when you got into the business, Mr. Uh, I, I don't know, because the decision had been made before I arrived, um, but I did. I, 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 I don't know. Right. Was that the subject of the analysis that you were referring to before? Correct. And that was documented by um, ANZ? The sort, the sort uh, of there, are, there are a, a series of documents uh, around ANZ's decision to exit. I'm not sure in, specifically in, in those documents if the claim rates um, are mentioned there, but um, in my handover communication, that was what I was told we've made these changes because we did a full review post the sale of a sander and, um, and that uh, we weren't comfortable with that the customer was getting value. Thank you. Was any part of that analysis, uh, or did any part of that analysis reveal the uh, commissions that uh, were being earned uh, in the ANZ group uh, on account of the sale of these insurances? Uh, again, I, I, I've not seen anything related to commissions paid. It was really around um, you know, the way it was communicated to me it was around... It's a done deal. It's it, not happening. Yeah, it's not, it's not a business that we want to participate in because of it's not demonstrating value to the customers. Yeah. One of the issues, and we'll return to this issue in a specific context relevant to a sander, but one of the issues that was raised by add-on insurance was that it was being sold in circumstances where people couldn't even remember or consenting to the purchase of the product. Are you aware of that issue? Uh, in some of the investigations through um, what we mentioned in this, that, is, that was, yes, the case. Uh, and high pressure sales tactics that were being used. Uh, I'm, not, I'm asking you at a general level here, I'm not asking, but are you familiar with those sorts of issues being raised? I'm, I'm familiar that customers um, have claimed that they were not aware of was agreeing to these products. Um, and you have said that in fact if not the determinative, one of the major factors was the fact that um, these sales were unsuitable where the consumer could either not claim or any claims that were made um, did not justify um, the insurance. Is that right? Again, the, the details of why the claim rates were not at industry averages I can't comment on. All I can tell you is that from an organisational perspective we were uncomfortable that we were selling products that customers were not claiming on. So that's all I can tell you. Thank you. Okay. If I can ask you some questions, if I may now, about the assessment of applications that um, were made during the relevant period. Um, Am I right to say that um, <coughs> ANZ rece received consumer motor vehicle uh, finance applications from dealers via the completion of a, an electronic form, or sometimes that was sent in a hard copy form? Correct. <coughs> Where the form was submitted electronically, would that information be um, inserted directly into ELS? The information would be, yes. Uh, 
now that's the Asanda lending system that we've already referred yes. to. Um, and is that then the same system that's used by the brokers today? Yes. But, thank you. Um, and if a hard copy form was used at, during the relevant period, um, then the information would be inputted by ANZ, would it? Uh, into the ELS system? Yes. Yes. So all applications for car loan finance in the relevant period made their way onto ELS? Correct. Now you describe in your statement um, a number of mandatory fields that had to be um, filled in uh, in the motor vehicle finance application. Yes. Um, and that included the customer information, the vehicle that was to be financed, um, and um, information which enabled the customer's ability to repay the facility to be assessed. Correct. Is that right? And once that information was in the system, if I can put it that way, in ELS, um, then there was an, an automated process, at least in part. In part. Yep. And can you explain to the Commission what that automated aspect was? So uh, once the information uh, is entered into the system, uh, it first of all goes through a fraud filter and then it goes into the what we call a scorecard and depending on the information entered, a decision will be made um, if it will, uh, it will be auto, uh, what we'll call approved, or it will be manually, it'll be referred to a, a, uh, a, a manual assessment. Thank you. And <coughs> one of the things that would be done would be analysing whether the consumer met the minimum requirements in terms of age time and employment and other policy rules, such as the maximum loan term? Correct. It'd be, it's important also to note that the system would check um, at that point as well. It would go to an external bureau, credit bureau, to see what the customer's bureau score is. And I think it was VITA that Yeah, VITA at to. the time, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and, sorry, if I can just unpack that a little bit. What, what were the relevant policy rules you refer to in your evidence? Uh, to approve or not approve? Yes. Uh, or to manually refer? Um, this, I'm referring now to what you describe as the analysis of whether the consumer met the minimum acceptable requirements in terms of age, uh, time and employment uh, okay. together so with other policy rules. So it would include, uh, obviously they had, to, they had to be over 18, they had to be in employment uh, for longer than three months. Um, it would check things like um, the state of what their bureau score would tell us, uh, it would uh, make a decision related to the level of their, un, uh, their, their uh, UMI um, and then dependent on that uh, we would make a decision. Sorry, what was the last point? The, the un, uh, UMI, the amount of income that they've got available to, um, uh, to, uh, to service the debt. I see. Um, Uncommitted monthly income. Sorry, I had a bit of a thank. You. No, thank you. Um, the, la uh, the last point there that you refer to is the analysis of whether the financial information provided in the application established a basis for enabling ANZ to ascertain whether or not the consumer had the ability to repay the proposed loan facilities. Correct. That's what I was just talking about. The yes. Undercommand. And um, you then go on to say that the manual, so if one assumes then that by virtue of that, if I can use this example, which must have occurred, there are then circumstances where that analysis says, relying on the information you receive from the dealer, we don't have enough information, then there's a manual component, is that correct? Correct, or um, there were things in there that uh, um, we would have rules, um, for example, uh, if the customer had had a certain number of bureau checks over a period of time, that would uh, trigger a manual assessment. Uh, if, um, yeah, there's just a series of different rules. If there was very tight on the, un you know, if it was at the low end of the uncommitted monthly income, that would trigger out a, uh, a, a manual referral as well. 
Um, the, you then go on to say that it that some of the steps could be a request for additional information, verification of financial information, um, and then an application of judgment to assess whether or not the application ought be approved. Um, You say that they could have involved that. Are there any other critical steps that? Um no, basically what happens um, is that uh, there's no, if, if the customer is in this part of the process, a trained credit assessor will look at the loan. They'll work uh, against, uh, the, there'll, be a pol there'll be a series of policy reasons why the loan has been manually referred. They'll look at the whole loan, but they'll look specifically at those and then they'll make a call based on, on, on that. Um, and that's part of our assessment process. When you say it could have involved an application of judgment to assess whether or not the application ought to be approved, having regard to the circumstance of the consumer's application as a whole, um, are you saying that not every manual component had that? Uh, no. It, some might be just a clarification of a piece of information. Some might be related to an existing customer who has a, has a bigger relationship with the bank and looking at, um, but generally it's verifying something that we are uncomfortable with that, uh, um, yeah, but un it's hard to, exp well, it's not hard to explain, but every situation is, is slightly different because every customer's um, circumstances are different. But these processes are critical though, aren't they? Because Absolutely, these there's a very tight, um, training regime, there's a credit authority discretion that depending on the threshold of what they're looking at is, um, that these people uh, also undergo monthly uh, hindsight reviews. So they'll take a series of loans that they do and somebody from a, a, a QA department will come in and, 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 and look at those. There's also a QA process where they'll make sure that all, everything that they've said they've done, they will do. So it's a very tightly uh, managed part of our business and it's a critical yeah, and, part of our business. Well, you would accept, of course, that that is, it's critical, in fact, to um, what compliance uh, ANZ, Sandra, at the relevant time, could have with the National Credit Act, isn't it? Yes, because it's about making sure that we're giving non-suitable loans by making sure that customer can afford them. It's a critical process, but you don't, you don't exhibit any documents which show that process, do you? Not in my witness statement. You were asked to though, weren't you, Mr Mendelson? Not, not to my knowledge. I can furnish any documents, but not to my understanding. So there are documents in existence? Absolutely. Um, In your evidence, you go on to explain the key components of the assessment of the consumer motor vehicle asset finance application. Are you, and you mentioned three types of um, documents. Verification, not Verification, assessment. sorry, thank you. Three um, components of the verification um, process. Um, is the use of the key components indicating that um, there's other matters of verification that occur that you haven't referred to? Uh, there could be others, um, depending on the circumstances. Um, for example, if you don't have a driver's licence, um, which you would hope if you're buying a car you do, but, um, you know, but we, we, you know, we might, if we're not sure, um, we might, uh, if we're not sure of the quality of it, we might ask for a passport. Medicare card. I see. Um, so, again, we're trying to be as uh, um, is helpful to say that it is that when you're assessing customers, every customer is different, and um, so as I said, um, part of the process is to make sure that we are taking all measures. This is not a a complete list, but generally they're the key ones that. I know. Um, I, know. I, I accept. Thank you for that explanation. I accept that. One thing that one thing though that um, you do in 26, paragraph 26, is you identify a driver's licence or other acceptable forms of identification, um, a supplier tax invoice to confirm the description of the motor vehicle, 
um, and then documentation to verify the income figure stated in the um, in the loan application. Well, that's an important step, isn't it? Because it's in, you need to take reasonable steps to verify the ability of the customer to be able to repay the loan, don't you? Yes. Although nothing in your statement suggests that at any time there was any verification of any information provided by customers about their expenses, was there? No. Um, and that's because ANZ didn't verify those expenses, did they? Uh, we, uh, like uh, previous answers to this question, use HEM. And uh, as the benchmark, and if the stated uh, living expenses is high, we'll take that. Um, I can tell you that also within uh, the policy as I know it today, there are also what we call sensitised parts within the uh, uh, in the expense calculations. For example, uh, if you're a homeowner, um, we take a much higher mortgage rate than is in the marketplace and apply that to sensitise that. Uh, if you have credit card uh, credit cards as part of your expenses, we take a percentage of the, the, of the balance of the credit card above that. So there is no formal mechanism, but um, we use HEM and um, that's what we have uh, been using. Can you tell me what percentage you apply to credit card debt? 3% uh, above whatever the balance is, about the limit, sorry. You, you do it by reference to limit? Limit, yes. And take a percentage of limit? Y yes. And assume that uh, the monthly repayment will be 3% of limit? Is yeah, of right? the total limit, regardless of where they are. Where in, the, where wherever they, they are. are. And on the mortgage, I can say to you at the moment, it's 7.25%. Um, Roughly or, speaking, uh, historical average. Yes, exactly, and we rate. review that annually. And, and unless their, their repayment is a higher amount <coughs> than that. But are there any other sensitivities or adjustments that you make on the expenditure side of the ledger? Uh, not on the expenditure side that I'm aware of. Does the application form uh, reveal or the application material reveal uh, the uh, family circumstances of the applicant? Yes, oh, we deal into that, um, yes. Thus the hem that is applied is yes. applied yes. Sorry, according to that, whether it's I... a couple yes. and a couple with dependents yes. as declared. Yes. Um, to be very transparent, we have been a little bit later in applying that in car loans, but we are in the there now. And other uh, financial uh, obligations, is there any uh, inquiry or verification in relation to uh, other obligations that the uh, customer may have other than housing loan or rent, credit card, and uh, HEM? Uh, no. So the UMI is based wholly on uh, an outlay side of the ledger that is comprised of, I think I've got them all, but you'll need to correct me, in effect housing, so either housing loan or rent, um, HEM and credit card service, assuming that uh, credit cards have been revealed. And then we have a catch-all, which is other, which could be covers a multitude of sins, Mr. Mendelssohn. Correct. <laughs> yes. You referred to some amendments that have <coughs> been made or 
um, through the sensitisation, I think was the term mm -hmm. that you use. Can you assist by identifying the time at which those things were done by ANZ? Uh, I don't have that information exactly when that was put into the process. Um, you, well, when it was introduced or what stage of the process, which is the question, Mr Donnelly? Were you asking when that started or at what stage of the process it happens? Yeah. My question was when those changes were made to the Actually, policy. Yeah, I, I, I don't have that information. Yes. I will call up if I'm, um, if I may, RCD.0022.0001.0001. I'm going to ask you some questions about the National Consumer Credit Protection Act 2009, with which you're obviously very familiar. Um, if, um, to go to 0098 first. Uh, Uh, a licensee relevantly a Sander or ANZ generally must not enter into a, a credit contract of which a car loans one um, and then if one skips down to on a day unle unless the licensee has within 90 days um, or other period prescribed by the regulations before the credit day D made inquiries and verification in accordance with section 130 I'll go ahead to that page to, to that section, I'm sorry, on the next page. Um, you're familiar with the reasonable inquiries that need to be made about a consumer in section 130 of the National Credit Act? Uh, yes. Um, and it requires reasonable inquiries to be made about the requirements and objectives in relation to the credit contract? A. Uh, yes. And if I take you to C, it says that t reasonable steps must be taken to verify the consumer's financial situation. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, and uh, one's financial situation, of course, incorporates not only um, income but also expenses. Yes. Um, and during the relevant period, um, um, during the relevant period, um, given the, the processes that we've just gone to, um, it might be said that um, some steps were lacking, is that right? Uh, I'm not qualified to answer that question. Um, can I take you to RCD.0021.0001.0088? Um, no doubt you're familiar with this document, Regulatory Guide 209. Uh, yes. Um, it deals, of course, with credit licensing and responsible lending conduct. Um, this is a document that sets out what might be described as good practice in relation to the provision of consumer credit. Yes. Um, can I take you to point 0103? This page, I think Sorry, so. what was your question before? My question was this sets out what might be considered good practice in relation to the provision of consumer credit. It's a guide to providing credit. I mean, it's, it's what the regulator says is... Um, Correct. ..is um, or what it provides by way of a regulatory guide. Correct. For the, for the industry? Correct. And it's something with which, AN, um, which ANZ takes seriously? Uh, at the highest level of seriousness. Thank you. Um, this is the base, isn't it? This is, yeah. Well, I don't know if you call it the base, but this is the... This is... The I very mean, by base, you'd like to do more, but you've got to do this. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Um, RG 
209.32, if I can just have that expanded to make it easier for you, Mr Mendelson. Reasonable inquiries about a consumer's financial situation will generally include, uh, and there's a reference to the consumer's current amount and source of income and benefits. See that? Yes. Um, and then B um, deals with fixed expenses and C variable living expenses. You see that? Yes. Uh, and if I skip ahead a few paragraphs to point zero one zero seven, specifically paragraph two hundred nine point four six. in words that um, are akin to those that we've just gone to in the Act, you are obliged to take reasonable steps to verify a consumer's financial situation. Generally, this will require some positive steps to verify the information provided by the consumer. Do you see that? Yeah. You're not going to read the rest of it? No, that's, I mean, you can if you wish. Um, I'm, not, uh, I'm not hiding it from you. Um, you'd agree that um, ASIC's assessment that the obligation to take reasonable steps requires some positive steps by a licensee to verify that information? I'm not really qualified to answer your question. Um. Would it be good in taking reasonable steps to verify the customer's financial information, you'd agree that ANZ should take some positive steps to do that? Again, I, I'm just uncomfortable to answer this question because I don't understand the legality of what you're asking me. Uh, look, and I'm not asking for your legal opinion. Um, my question was just put as a person um, well versed in, uh, in, in the business of lending that you would accept, would you not, that ANZ ought to take positive steps to confirm, to verify the information provided by a consumer? What I would say to you is that ANZ takes this document very seriously. Um, our intent is that when we lend money that we want to get it back and that we'll do everything during the process to make sure that we are not providing credit to people that are unsuitable. Um, again, I. I I, I feel uncomfortable to answer the question, but the intent of what the organisation is trying to do, as I said, is to do the right thing by customers. If you lend money to people, you want to get it back because that's the nature of our business. And uh, by not doing proper assessment, you are not availing yourself of the opportunity to get that money back at the end of the period. Well, in November 2014, when this guide was written, that's during the relevant period, isn't it, that we're discussing? Correct. Um, and your evidence would apply to the approach that a sander would take as at that time? Yes. Um, you're dealing with the relevant period. You've, if I've understood your evidence, you've said that there's no processes in place to require verification of the expenses at that time that were provided by a consumer? Other than what I have um, stated before. Thank you. Can I deal with another issue, Mr Mendelson, what is described as a guarantor swap incident? Yes. I think that's using the language of ANZ's response to the Commission. What, well perhaps you can assist by explaining what that issue was uh, for the business? Sure. So the issue related to um, we were provided a guarantor's financial information when we did the assessment. Yes. Uh, that was generally a better quality customer and under those circumstances um, we approved the loan. What do you mean by s what's meant by swap? So uh, we asked for, in those circumstances, uh, uh, somebody to guarantee the loan. And um, so they had the 
information for the person who was going to get the benefit of the car and they had the information of the person who was going to guarantee that loan. Yes. And instead of submitting the information in the loan application form for the customer that was going to get the benefit of the car, they put the information of the person who was going to guarantee the loan into the loan application. And, and this, as I understand it, was something that had been, and I won't use the name, if you go to paragraph 72 of your statement, and you'll be able to see it, I think, in the document before you, uh, on page 17 of your statement. Um, ANZ detected what you've described, a potential guarantor swap misconduct in about May 2013 from a particular um, dealer. That is correct. Um, and you found out? Again, just to be clear, it was a broker, not a dealer. A, a broker. Uh, and there was subsequently um, an investigation into what had occurred? That's correct. Um, and, uh, and ultimately, um, there was a remediation plan that was agreed with, with ASIC by ANZ in relation to this <coughs> issue? Yes. Um, and what had happened, or what Asanda agreed, would it would remediate more than 70 customers for car loans that had been provided by Asanda where this issue had arisen? Uh, the eventual number was actually 92. I'm sorry? The eventual number was actually 92. We had a series of consultations with the regulator on this um, case, but uh, the eventual number was, um, if you... I see. Um, I'm sorry, I, I think at the moment you've... Um, yeah, at this stage there was various interactions with, with the regulator around this issue. Because yeah, we've never seen, um, to my knowledge, I've never seen anything like this occur in my career um, at, and prior to this and post this. So it was quite a complicated process to understand. At that initial point um, in the process in May 13 when we did the investigation, we actually met with the organisation and the, um, there were people dismissed from that organisation and it wasn't late until we found out that there was a wider issue. I see. Um, why, 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 wider so issue because it went beyond that organisation or within the No, within the organisation, to be very clear, within the organisation. Yes. But we, we identified it, um, it was related to an individual. We met with the owner of that business. That person was um, uh, dismissed um, and at a later date, um, it was revealed that there were more people within that organisation undertaking the same practice. Yeah. And ANZ <coughs> acknowledges that this, um, that the systems Asanda had in place at the time were ineffective in this regard? Yes. Um, and that it constituted misconduct? Yes. Um, in the response, I won't take you to it, but ANZ said that ultimately it suspended the accreditation of some individual brokers implicated in the guarantor swap issue and ceased dealing with them. Do you recall that? Yeah, well, that's what I was just talking yes. about, yes. Um, you say only some of them, though. Did I, um, can you assist by explaining how, um, if at all... Um, others that were implicated in the guarantor swap issue were dealt with by ANZ in terms of ongoing... So ongoing once we understood the wider <laughs> ramifications of what was going on, we no longer... Um, we disaccredited the actual organisation, the broker. I see. Um, so it's not the... It's not... The position is that, that there's... Um, that only some of the brokers implicated were disaccredited? Is it the position that all of them...? So, just to be clear, what the issue was, was we had a broker who yes. had a series of employees. Um, the initial investigation identified an employee that we worked with that particular broker to dismiss. Yes. We then subsequently found out that 
the issue was broader and that was the start of um, discrediting the broker as the business because clearly um, there, were, there were issues there. Excuse me just for a moment, Mr. Mendelson. And, and what did Asanda do and now ANZ do to ensure that this uh, wouldn't happen again. Uh, so if I can draw you to, we stopped accepting um, guarantors. And um, when? Well, officially, uh, we put a system change in in mid two thousand and um, seventeen. Um, but it was my understanding that we stopped it immediately after, in um, preparation for coming to the Royal Commission. We did identify about 50 customers in that period between 2014 to 2017 that had some form of guarantor associated with it. So we can't confident we can't confidently say that um, uh, that those loans did or didn't have a, a guarantee. It's a it's a it's a field within um, within the system. So we would that's why we restated the number. Yeah, yeah. I understand the criticism. You've corrected paragraph 79, yeah. but can I understand the position? The position is that as at mid 2017, no guarantors are, are allowed. allowed. Correct. What happened immediately following this organisation and this issue arising? Uh, as I said, originally I, I was informed that we stopped taking guarantees at that point. I see. But the process wasn't until mid-2017 that... The that system stopped. change. Yes. The, so from a technology perspective, after 2017, even if you wanted to put a guarantee, attempt to put a guarantee into the system, it wouldn't allow it. But that change wasn't made in 2014. You could still have a... Using yes. the ELS system, I assume it was the ELS. Yes. So am I right to say that on your evidence, guarantors were only stopped in mid-2017? Yes. Thank you. It was a footnote reference in the, um, the um, response, but it raises an issue I'd like to explore with you, and that is that this same organisation I mean, you know the organisation I'm talking yes. about. This same organisation had been providing um, add-on insurance um, or, or perhaps I can use your language. I am, am I right to say that in the course of this um, or at around this time, in October 2014, ANZ became aware of the potential sale of add-on insurance to consumers by this organisation in circumstances where the consumer hadn't consented or had knowledge of that? Yes. How did, uh, how did, I know you weren't there, how did Asanda become aware of that? Uh, we became aware of it when we did the file reviews of, of what were the impact to customers. But again, to be clear, this investigation, we were supplying through a series of um, requests from the regulator um, files and they were, we were informed by them. I and see. as part of our rem rem uh, remediation process, um, if customers were impacted um, through the sale that they weren't aware of, we refunded that. Yes, I'll say, I'll come to that and I'll ask you a, a question or two about that. But, sorry, was it ANZ that discovered this issue? Or was it ASIC in the course of their work and then they said, because what you say it's paragraph 74, as I understand it, um, was that ANZ became aware of it in a meeting with ASIC. Correct. That means that ASIC informed it. Correct. ASIC was sending us, um, through this period, a series of request, um, 
and under and it, various other provisions of the Act. Um, they, yeah, they, information. They, they were investigating this issue and we were collaborating with them to understand the extent and the nature of the issue. How much is the remediation that was given in relation to this issue? The total amount? Yes. It was $753,000. Um, and in relation to, and I understand it's still ongoing, but the remediation for the guarantor swap incident, how much is no, that? No, this is the guarantor swap. The other, you're talking about the... I, I'm distinguishing between the add-on insurance. Oh, in the add-on insurance, add insurance out of the three, 753 was $21,558. Thank you. And what, if anything, um, is 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 now in place to um, seek to prevent this issue arising? As I said before, we don't accept uh, guarantors for car. Uh, and in relation to um, add-on insurance, uh, well, we've ceased selling the major products. Um, we only, as I said earlier. Uh, focus on comprehensive car insurance and uh, uh, um, loan protection insurance. And again, we run uh, annual um, checks on claim rates to make sure that what's being sold has actually been, um, actually the customer's getting value from. Um, and particularly through the broker channel now, also we are only dealing with providers, allowing brokers to deal with providers that are APRA approved insurers as well. Who uh, do you rely on APRA for it to determine the insurers or is there a separate analysis by ANZ as to who the appropriate? The regulator. Thank you. I have two um, um, broad issues to deal with. The, first, the second last is to deal with um, what you've described in your um, uh, your statement as fraudulent conduct by three intermediaries. Now, I'm not going to mention who they are. Yes. Uh, I've um, already um, said something about um, this at the start of your evidence. You'll recall that I asked you to identify the time period in which certain fraud had been um, identified by ANZ. Correct. Um, so the guarantor swap incident with, that we've been dealing with and that the, the add-on insurance wasn't the full extent of um, ANZ's difficulties with responsible lending obligation. It also arose in, in this case in relation to three intermediaries um, who had, um, so, oh, sorry, who had um, falsified um, or provided falsified um, documents? Correct. And there has been um, a civil civil penalty pr proceeding which has dealt with some part of this um, conduct. I believe it's dealt when with I, the entire thing. Yeah. When I say some part of it, there was. Um, 12 representative motor vehicle Correct. finance applications Correct. that were dealt with. But there were more that were the subject of um, concerns. Correct. And we were mediating more. And I understand that and we'll come to that. Um, For the assistance of the media, uh, the name that's been mentioned should not be reported. I'll um, direct uh, non-publication of the name and redaction of the transcript accordingly. Thank you, Commissioner, and with my apologies for the sleep, I've done well until now. Um, the, potent the point of sale um, exemption applied to the company which you talk about at paragraph 38, didn't it? Correct.
And I'm not going to go to that. Uh, and in the course of um, in the course of those previous um, proceedings, generally in relation to all three of those companies, um, ANZ um, was aware that pay slips were a type of document that could be falsified. Yes. Um, and that some third parties had provided a sander with falsified pay slips. Yes. And that um, ANZ had reason to doubt the reliability of the information it was receiving from some intermediaries. That's what we've acknowledged. And in relation to um, some instances of conduct, there's been an acceptance by ANZ that it failed to take reasonable steps to verify the financial situations of some customers in circumstances where um, it failed to take those reasonable steps. That's what we've acknowledged, yes. Um, and also, um, insofar as its processes were in place at that time, that is broadly, because the different companies are different times, but it's over a period of approximately um, three years, um, you accept that during that period, um, I'm sorry, the period was two years, I misled you, from July 2013 to May 2015. During that period, you accept that um, generally ANZ had um, failed to take reasonable steps to verify the financial situations um, of consumers because of the, this issue? That's what we've um, acknowledged, yes. What could have ANZ done uh, that it didn't do? Uh, as I explained before, pay slip fraud um, is uh, a complicated and Many splendid thing. Yeah, um, I think some of the things that we've identified and we've put rectifications in is we could have identified some of these cases earlier. So there were some collections calls where um, we could have um, uh, referred the customer at that stage to our fraud team. We've now got a, a much better process for that in place and also a, 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 a fraud team within the collections um, team. Uh, I think we, you know, we are continually training staff around identifying fraud and making them aware of something, you know, that it's crucial in the way that they go about it. Um, as I said, we've put more staff into our fraud department. We have put more rules into our fraud detection system. Um, we are, you know, hyper vigilant um, around this. But uh, as I said, the nature of fraud is incredibly dynamic and the type of people that are trying to defraud large organisations like banks are increasingly sophisticated, so. But can I just, I'm, I'm really asking about paragraph 55 of your statement, I think, aren't I? Uh, if you go to paragraph 55 of your statement on page 14 of the statement. Yes. <clears throat> the admissions and the civil penalty proceedings uh, concern two obligations, failure to take reasonable steps and making a contract without first having taken reasonable steps. It's the content of the admission that I'm uh, trying to understand. Uh, yes, uh, ANZ admits it didn't take reasonable steps. Um, what I'm trying to get a grip on is uh, what are the reasonable steps that it admits it didn't take? Uh, look, fundamentally, uh, we there were circumstances where we could have potentially identified where human error came into the play. Um, as I said, potentially um, collections could have identified some of these earlier. But collections is after the event, isn't it? Uh, correct. 
So we're talking about the point During the of settlement. grant of the credit. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I'm not well versed to explain it in a you know in a, in a, in a legal perspective. No. Um, so from our from our sense is that um, you know our settlement team didn't pick this up. Uh, and didn't pick it up because there was enough material it had in the information yes. it had yes. to point to the fact that there may be something dodgy about the payslip. Correct. Now, what is it? Uh, what what would it look we'll like? to the yeah. limit of your knowledge at some no, point. No, no, no. What, will, what would a, a dodgy payslip look like that they could well, have picked no, up? No, what was it that would have or could have or should have alerted settlements or whichever part of the process it was to the fact that there may be a dodgy payslip? Uh, anything from uh, things such as uh, no ABN on the payslip, uh, different types of uh, font inconsistent year-to-date figures, because remembering they've got to have three there. Um, so there's a series of different things that they could have picked up. The payslip itself yeah. may have been such as to the, and that's the part of the training that we provide to them yes. to be able to identify when they're looking at pay slips to be really clear that that uh, uh, that um, you know that they're they're looking at those key <coughs> components of what could be a fraudulent pay slip. I see. Yes. When was that training put in place? Uh, training's been ongoing. It was it was occurring during the period. Um, and it, as it gets updated every year by our fraud department. And uh, what we've done is we've increased the velocity of that training. So both our assessment team and our settlements team undertake at least an hour of training every quarter um, to keep it top of mind and to make sure that they're really looking out for, for that in their day-to-day -day interactions. <coughs> But dur during that relevant time, now I'm talking about a different relevant yeah. period, the 2003 to 2015, but during that time, the, um, the training wasn't sufficient? Uh, the training was there, uh, uh, um, but uh, clearly it wasn't sufficient because we've made these admissions. Um, so, yes. Um, and you did your invest the investigation, or at least one of the investigations, arose um, it was undertaken in May 2014. The one at paragraph 30, sorry. 36B or? Uh, 36B, yes. Yes. Uh, and you subsequently told ASIC about that in September of that year, is that right? Um, the process is that this uh, gets reported through uh, another regulatory body. I see. So you and then that. Sorry, go on, Mr. Mendel. I, I'm not sure I'm allowed to uh, declare that, but we. Well, we I, I'm asking you not in relation to any other body. I'm just asking about when you spoke, when you, when at ANZ um, raised this issue with with ASIC. Uh, ASIC were informed um, through another body because. Yeah, that, that, I don't so need to go just, any, any yeah. further. I'm just, if I can take you to paragraph 45. Yeah, that, that's when ASIC informed us. I don't have the specific dates when we informed the other organisation. I see. Um, now. You've given some evidence about the processes that are in place to seek to prevent this happening going forward. Yes. In fact, you um, deal with this particular issue at paragraph 48. Correct. Um, and I understand that there's confidentiality over some aspects of that, and I won't ask you yeah, can I just uh, explain why there's confidentiality over that, namely that if uh, ANZ reveals its fraud detection processes, uh, uh, that may be something that uh, people might take advantage of, is perhaps the most charitable way of putting it. Is that right, Mr Mendelson? That's correct. Yes. 
uh, and um, on the next page, um, less sensitively, but important, I'm sure you'll say nonetheless, are the steps that have been taken to create a broker forum and clarification of ANZ's broker consequence management framework. What's a broker consequence management framework? Okay, so uh, part of um, a, a broad uh, scope of work that we've undertaken is that um, we, if, if you will allow me, I'll talk to them all in a sequential um, way, is that okay? Yes. So we've introduced a, a customer interview guide to make sure that when we are talking to the customer that their needs and objectives of their uh, loan are understood and that needs to be signed by both the broker and the customer and that needs to be done uh, before any information around how the loan is going to be implemented into the system needs to occur. What we do is the obligation of the broker, which is covered in the training that I referred to earlier, is to keep that on file. And we say to them that at times we will call for that to review that. So what we then do is that we have a file compliance review process um, that occurs monthly, whereby we use um, uh, data, which is the part of um, uh, the part A, which is sort of uh, redacted, to identify any um, uh, issues that have occurred during the application process by brokers. So it could be um, multiple entries for uh, a customer. Um, and then we do a sample also of those file reviews. We then, um, those reviews are brought in and there's a 65 checkpoint review that we undertake to make sure that that's been properly completed. If there are issues in that, uh, in that uh, 65 point checklist, what we then do is we then do what we call a qualitative file review. We do a full review of that customer. And again, we go through all of the file to make sure that um, uh, uh, that, that is uh, what they've said they uh, were going to do is actually accurate. Um, we then, um, subsequent to those reviews, we then have a monthly broker forum whereby there's a, there's a series of um, uh, each state, we operate a national business, each state manages a, a pool of, cus of brokers and what they'll do is they will um, talk about the consequence management of those customer interview guides and those qualitative file reviews um, by state, but they talk about it nationally so there's a consistent approach in dealing into it. Um, so that some of the actions at that could be to go back and educate the broker uh, there could be a financial penalty or it could be disaccreditation. And um, since we've um, implemented this in March 17, we've done circa 8,000 of these file reviews and we are at the, at the process at the moment of looking into actually um, disaccrediting three brokers. Um, where we're seeking financial penalty from uh, uh, roughly 90 other brokers and um, we've had to educate 800 plus custom uh, brokers on just not filling in the right, you know, checklists. Um, the process from going to educate to uh, to financial penalty is if we educate them on something and they repeatedly don't do what we ask them to do, uh, and then the the disaccreditation is related to uh, employees of brokers submitting um, loans that they they're not they haven't they haven't done our training. So it's quite a, a complex uh, process that we undertake. Um, the other thing that we are doing, as I said, is in talk, spoken about enhancing um, the training around fraud, both internally and externally. Obviously, we can't leave fraud documents with our broker community because within that is historic, in, in the training packs are historical examples of where fraud has occurred across all the different types. But we go to professional development days and we talk about not only this type of uh, fraud, but also cyber fraud, so that we can really keep everybody uh, on top of it. And lastly, uh, for existing customers now, in that um, application process um, that we spoke about before, if it's either a auto approve or a, uh, a, a manual approve, we check our banking system to make sure that if um, they have told us they've got a salary credit, that we line that up into our into the ANZ system. So we've we we call it a continuous improvement program because 
as I said, the nature of this will be it will be an evolving issue, um, and we work um, uh, across quarterly cycles to make sure that we are continually improving it. We used to run this specifically for auto finance. It's now been rolled into a wider Australian division continuous improvement program to make sure that what we're applying is consistent across the bank. Thank you. And you, you've, you identified there the date of March 2017. Um, that's also the date that you say in your um, evidence was when an attorney... In sorry, sorry, I meant March 2016, not 17. Okay. No, sorry, I get my years. Where are we, 18? Uh, 17, you are right, yeah. Um, that's when the internal so where, monthly... Where, where did we land? <laughs> What's the right answer? <laughs> I got there in 16, so it's 17. It's 17. Yeah, sorry, I apologise okay. about that. It seems, and I understand the evidence you've given about those improvements, but there, it's still fair to say that there's a significant amount of time that elapsed between the first investigation of fraud in respect of the first company, and even if you take into account when the last one occurred, approximately nine months later, I think June 2015, and the sort of um, improvements that you say um, occurred um, as a response nearly two years later. Yes, I accept that. Can I ask you about the remediation program that's been implemented by um, ANZ in relation to these three intermediaries, please. Yes. Um, I'm repeating what I said a moment ago. The, the three relevant organisations and the three fraudulent activities, by the time you'd wrapped up the third one, it was the investigation of it, it was June 2015, wasn't it? Uh, the internal investigation, yes. Yes. Um, and I'm not uh, seeking to make it a memory test, but you say in paragraph 38B that in the period from 5 May 2015 until 12 June 2015, the ANZ fraud team conducted an investigation of a number of applications submitted by that organisation over a period of more than 12 months. Do you see that? Yes. Um, and then a decision was made by ANZ to um, develop a remediation program? Correct. Um, and in fact, you, I think, were, um, you were on this team? Correct. Um, and it was formed to develop a program to remediate customers who had been affected by these relevant frauds? Yes. Um, that project team was set up in November 2016. Do you have any explanation for why it took so long for it to be set up? Uh, no, um, just short of the fact that we were... Um, I can't explain um, why the, the time difference was, um, but when I was arrived in the role, it was very clear that we needed to get on with the remediation. I see. Um, it was always our intent to remediate these customers. Um, and and we were working with the regulator. And you say that, um, well, perhaps I can take you to GSM 1 um, of your statement, which I think you've got there in, in front of you. I've G got it. GSM 1. Thank you. I don't have a document. I just don't have a document. We'll just try to get it up on the screen. As well, it's ANZ.800.259.0175. Um, can you explain to me what this document is, Mr. Mendelssohn? Uh, yeah, this is a uh, explanation of the timeline of events related to the remediation program for the three introduced of fraud. I see. Um, the same three introducers that we've, that been, we've been discussing. Yes, thank you. Um, and am I right to say that, um, as at the time of this document, I think this document was prepared um, only last month. Perhaps is that right? Or at least recently. I, should... I can't tell you when this document was prepared. Um, 
it, um, perhaps I'll put it this way, is it still the, is this still accurate in terms of the further steps required for the remediation project? For, can you be more Is specific? this still the program that your team is working towards? Correct. In relation to remediation? Absolutely. That is to say, expected completion of remediation December 2018. Correct. So we, uh, as per our, uh, agreement with ASIC, ran a pilot in January of 46 customers yes. to make sure that what our remediation um, philosophy was was going to work. Um, the agreement with the regulator then was that our internal audit team would do a sense check over that, which they did, and we have subsequently commenced um, in March completing the remediation. So the remaining, we, we're going to remediate 324 customers, so we've done 46, so the balance of that. We say December 18 because we've learnt from previous remediations that sometimes it's hard to find the customers. So um, we, we're hoping that if we can find all the customers involved that this will complete earlier. Um, but we have a project team and a team of people who are currently completing the remediation. I see. Uh, and we've heard some evidence from one of your colleagues in relation to those rem remediation programs. Um, there was a... Um, the... Can I understand how ANZ came to identify the approximately 320? Uh, yeah, so what we did is we, um, through the fraud investigations, there were, a f we thought approximately 547 impacted customers, we thought, um, through the fraud. And then what we agreed um, with ASIC was that any customer who had missed a payment by 60 days or greater would um, become part of the remediation group and that formed the 324 that we've agreed to remediate. Uh, and can I take you to ANZ.800.240.0088? Now I'm taking you back in time um, to the 19th of July 2017. This is, if you'd like to look at it, in front of you, GSM um, 2. Um, can you explain what the Asanda proposed customer remediation document in front of, uh, on the screen and in front of you is? Uh, it was a document that we um, uh, took to, the re to ASIC to confirm um, our approach. Um, if you go to the next page, you, re you refer to um, a letter where ANZ does not accept liability for the frauds. Do you see that? Yes. Um, I'm not putting it that it's um, ANZ that was in um, itself um, that did this, but you do accept, however, that the reasonable steps to verify the financial situ situations of customers um, were lacking. Uh, I don't really understand what your point is. The, the, the reasonable... I've asked you previously when we went to the processes of verification and I think you accepted that uh, improvements could be made to the process to help identify these issues. Is that right? That is to say... Well, that's what I just outlined before, yes. Uh, and you say um, here that you, um, in the last dot point, that ANZ proposed to focus on those whose loans had been in arrears for a single period of 90 or more days Correct. at any point during the loan term. Correct. Uh, that period changed, didn't it? Correct. Um, and, um, and what is it now? 60. And why did you change that? Uh, that was the request of ASIC. I see. Is the premise for the remediation that the fraud is the fraud of the broker, not the fraud of the customer? The premise of the remediation is that a customer has been impacted and we want to make sure that we do the right thing. I don't think we are at any stage during the remediation process trying to work out you know, what has occurred. We just want to make sure that if customers have been impacted that we're doing the right thing by them. 
and we work closely with the regulator to uh, uh, agree a, a, a fair and balanced outcome for the customer. Yes. What about um, what about any mis-selling of add-on insurance that's occurred in relation to this? this? Yes. So at the very last, um, we, we've, we've said to the regulator that if we identify that through our investigation through this process, that we will refund that. Is that right? Is that what ANZ said? Or is it only if a customer raises this as an issue? Well, yes, but we were, yes. Can't it be the case, however, that you could identify in the course of your work that there has been mis-selling of add-on insurance, even if, as was the case with that other organisation, some people don't even know they're being sold that? Uh, we, the, the, the challenge with that was, the, the biggest issue with this whole process has been the amount of time between when the customer, the potential customer was impacted and getting a remediation program going. Um, internally, um, there's been a lot of uh, concern about that period from very senior leaders, including uh, customer advocate. Um, if we were to uh, include add on insurance, it, the, the ability to go and find out if they had it or they did not have it would mean that we could not start the remediation process even to a later point. So our intent always was that if a customer had said that they had add on insurance that we would absolutely um, remediate them. I need to understand that evidence. Is your evidence that you, by going back to check if there'd been a mis-selling of add-on insurance, it will take you longer to remediate in relation to the issue of the, the pay slips that we've been discussing? Correct. But that doesn't follow, does it? I mean, why couldn't, if, if it is the position that customers uh, have been aggrieved by this process and suffered financial loss, uh, that is the subject of remediation because of the issue that we've identified. Why does it not also follow that if there's been uh, the same <coughs> issue in relation to add-on insurance, they should be remediated for that too? I said that we would if... The, the trouble is, uh, our challenge is getting the data to understand if they had or they did not have add-on insurance. I so see. therefore that would take us longer and our concern is already the period of time with which um, this, f between when the fraud occurred and when we we're remediating the customer. I, is that what you mean when you say when it's in paragraph 66 that you incorporated ASIC suggestions insofar as they were operationally feasible? Correct. Um, so not all of ASIC's suggestions have been incorporated, only those that are operationally feasible. Again, the conversation with the regulator has been to remediate these customers as quickly as possible, given the time that has elapsed. So in the conversations that we had, we were very transparent about what we could do as quickly as possible. And this was a challenge. And the position that we got to collectively was that if was the position that stated. Can I ask you this? Clearly though, is why can't ANZ remediate someone twice? Because we, because we wanted to do, from a, custom, from a customer perspective, we wanted to do the, the fair thing and get to it as quickly as possible. And we thought, and we spoke with the regulator about it, the best way to do it was to start the remediation. And if they had add-on insurance, we would, we would refund it. But there wouldn't be a proactive investigation of any issues with um, add-on insurance from ANZ's point of view? I'm not exactly sure what you mean by proactive. Well, ANZ would not uh, investigate the issue of add-on insurance unless it was raised by the customer. Look, I don't have the scripts of what we're doing in front of us, but I, I, I think I don't want you to insinuate that we're reneging our responsibility towards the customers because that's not our intent. Our intent is to remediate customers that were impacted by fraud quite a substantial period of time ago. We've gone through a, a, a quite a long process with the regulator, and um, we want to get to it. We're not hot, we're not skirting our responsibilities. 
I, I put it, the point I'm making is, is this. ANZ is, um, and no criticism is made of this, is remediating, um, albeit it, will, it won't occur fully until the end of the year, is remediating in relation to the issues that have arisen in relation to those three intermediaries. That's right, isn't it? Correct. In relation to add-on insurance, there is no remediation in place. No, but the issue that we're remediating is the payslip fraud. I understand. So through the process, we have been very clear to the regulator, and I'm obviously not explaining myself clearly enough to you, is that if we see, if the customer through the process has been unduly impacted by being sold out on insurance, we will if fulfill our obligation to remediate that. And I understand your evidence, and that is different though to the other organisation where you had knowledge that there had been sales of add-on insurance without the person's consent? Again, we remediated those customers yes. as well, as previously stated. Can I go to... Um, um, there's one final topic I'd like to deal with. Um, it, um, at the time that you made your statement to the Commission, um, ANZ continued to receive consumer motor vehicle applications from two primary sources. Correct. Um, and they were brokers and direct sales. Correct. Um, now, last Friday, as I understand it, there was a, an announcement by ANZ. Can you tell the Commission what that announcement was? Uh, the announcement related to ANZ suspending its consumer finance, its consumer <coughs> car loan business uh, as of April 13, 2018. Um. Uh, um, so what, um, does that mean that both the, um, both the uh, sources that we were referring to will both be um, halted? Yes. And how long, um, you say that this will happen as of the 13th of April of this year? A 30th. 30th, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, the 30th of April? Correct. Uh, and perhaps I can call up um, ANZ dot, uh, it might be RCD dot zero zero two one dot zero 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 one dot zero three zero three. This is um, the media release of last Friday. Correct. ANZ today announced it will suspend providing new secured asset finance loans for retail customers in Australia while it undertakes a detailed review of its business. You see that? Yes. Uh, and you say, uh, sorry, ANZ says in that, um, or describes what we've just um, in the second paragraph, the fact that it covers both direct and broker originator channels. Yes. Uh, and that it will continue to service its current um, customers. Uh, yes. Um, and why, um, why was that decision made by um, ANZ last Friday? Sure. So the background to this decision, the situation was that when we sold the Asanda business, um, the ELS system that we've referred to, the Asanda lending system, uh, was not integrated into um, key ANZ systems. Uh, the business imperative was to secure funding to ensure that occurred. Uh, we have been through various cycles of funding um, and we have been given different time frame gates which we've not been able to meet internally as a, from, a, from a funding allocation perspective uh, and uh, 
this decision had been made and we furnished documents. Um, uh, I was in a meeting in January 18 with the CEO of, of the Australia Division and the Chief Risk Officer where the decision was made to cease it. Um, the announcement came out last Friday uh, because obviously I was due to come to the Royal Commission and we didn't want customers and staff and shareholders to find out if I was asked the question, but the decision to pause um, had already been made and reported not only to the CEO but to the board of the bank through the Chief Risk Officer. Um, so as I said, the announcement was made because I didn't want to, I wanted to be, I have to be fair and honest and uh, <coughs> to the Commission and as I said, we didn't want it to be revealed by me sitting here being asked a question um, and being perverting the course of justice, so to speak. Thank you. And why you said that, amongst other things, step one was the ELS was not integrated into key ANZ Correct. systems. And the second step, I think, was that it was necessary to ensure funding to do it. Correct. Yes. Why was that necessary? I, I can understand it might have been convenient to do it. Why was it necessary? To why was it necessary to to integrate ELS into the oh, um, wider ANZ system. Bec uh, the bank has particular uh, risk profiles and um, we have a whole series of very sophisticated new, particularly credit systems, um, both at the, at the beginning of a customer's journey with us and all the way at the end. And that's the way that the bank operates. And if the auto finance business wasn't integrated into those systems, um, we couldn't, we didn't feel like it was an acceptable risk to operate the business. What was the, the risk's not acceptable, are you able to tell me what the risk was, or the nature of the risk? Oh, the nature of the risk, the risk. Uh, well the nature of the risk is we had potential to be, continue to have responsible lending um, challenges, so um, the, the, the big big piece is to make sure that all the systems are integrated into one set of systems so that we can operate the business efficiently and effectively and um, with an acceptable risk profile. So um, as I said, our, our systems are, are not integrated into ANZ um, because the SAND historically was not, you know, pre-2009 was not part of the bank, it was not incorporated and uh, it's it was uh, it was an unacceptable risk um, um, that the bank said w that it couldn't accept. But it's fundamentally related to um, making sure that we're providing the right outcomes for customers. Your, a lot of your, a lot of the evidence we've gone to today um, suggests that a lot of steps were being made in relation to ANZ's responsible lending in this car loan uh, part of its business that had improved the responsible lending uh, processes, wasn't it? Correct. But the very reason why this part um, of the business is being halted as of the 30th of April is because uh, of the risks to responsible lending within ANZ, isn't it? No, it's not the whole reason. The, the rationale for doing it is that we don't, um, we want to scale the business, we want to participate in the business. We don't have a system that will allow us to scale it. And by not having a system that allows us to scale it, it puts, our, it puts the bank at risk and so, one of those issues could potentially be responsible lending issues, but it's much broader than that. And as I said, the obligation of um, one of the key responsibilities to be, without going into a lot of detail, the bank has been running a new asset finance system um, as for the last probably seven years, a project called Global Asset Finance, and the last part of that was to get um, this part of the business onto it. As I said, we've not been able to secure funding. There have been other priorities in the bank and until such time that we can secure funding, what we'll be, what we've said at the end of that is that we're going to undertake a, a strategic review which may include partnering, white labelling with another um, party who might issue um, 
loans on our behalf, but we will use their technology. It may be that we will get funding in the next bank year, which uh, commences in October. M Ms Noble's um, attributed in that statement to the increased technology costs required to effectively compete in the secured consumer asset finance market, but it's also the uh, the fact that on the basis of the current technology there are real risks to responsible lending within ANZ. I, I don't agree with that. Can I, um, can I tender that document please, Commissioner? As I said, the, 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 the key piece around operating a business like this is to, and to be competitive in this uh, space, is to have, uh, have a technology system that allows you to operate efficiently, effectively at scale. Part of it is providing a, a better digital um, uh, proposition to customers as the world evolves. And um, we are dealing, ELS was launched in 1982. So we are not uh, at a position where we would be able to uh, be competitive. And as I said, um, the key, uh, one of the key premises has been to uh, to make sure that um, ANZ operates all its systems integrated. Exhibit 1.152 will be ANZ Media Release 16 March 2018, RCD 0021-0003-03. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, can I take Mr Mendelson to ANZ.800.128.0420, please? Um, can you tell me um, what um, the Operational Risk Executive Committee is? Uh, yeah, that is the highest risk committee of the bank. Uh, and. Um, and you indicated previously that you were part of a decision in January, is that right? Uh, I was, uh, my line manager was on holidays and I was sitting in for him and there was a meeting that was held between uh, the head of our retail business, our Chief Risk Officer for Australia and our CEO of Australia. I see. Um, and um, a decision was made um, at that meeting, was it, to do that which was announced on Friday? Correct. Um, and at the 12th of February, on, the, on this 12th of February meeting, um, one of the issues, uh, and I'll take you to it, at point um, 0450, uh, The background is explained as there are two high extreme risk acceptances extensions relating to asset finance and commercial lending that are under review and CRO endorsement is pending. Does that mean that there was two things that were listed as high extreme risk that were coming up for review by the bank? Is that an accurate uh, summation of that first sentence? Oh, that's correct. And one of those was, which is the first point, um, responsible lending currently rated as extreme. Do you see that? Yes. Uh, and further explain then under one, responsible lending obligations apply to the sale of consumer asset finance products through ANZ proprietary channels and commercial broker first and third party distribution channels. That's what we've been discussing today, haven't we? Yes. And then 
the first dot point, in light of the external regulatory environment, uh, asset finance increased the residual risk rating of responsible lending risk from high to extreme. Can you see that? Uh, yes. Um, the extreme risk acceptance was endorsed at Group um, OREC, which I think is the reference to Operational Risk Executive Committee, the very committee yes. there. Um, in May 2017, the risk acceptance was approved to 31 October and was dependent on funding for the Global Asset Finance Program. Is that what you were referring to before? <coughs> yes. So am I right to say that um, the risk in relation to responsible lending within ANZ during 2017 was listed as extreme? Uh, so my understanding that the responsible lending uh, risk was taken to extreme was related, and this is to my knowledge, was related to uh, the three introducer fraud, not to the system. I Well, risk is forward-looking, isn't it, Mr Mandelson? Yeah, and at that stage, we weren't sure of the consequence of the investigation into, uh, into that investigation. Is, that your, is your evidence that the extreme risk that is referred to there is something limited to the issue that we were discussing previously, those three intermediaries? That is my understanding. Can I just ask you what date this... Yes, this is the 10th. This document is the... 12th February 12th. 18. So, again, my understanding was I was in the business at the time. 12 February 18. N no, Brett, this was... Uh, the extreme risk acceptance was endorsed by ORIC in... 2017, May 2017. Yes. My understanding of that um, is that that was related to the three introducer fraud, because we weren't we weren't sure what ASIC. We hadn't had a final engagement with ASIC on that. Well, I put it to you that the extreme risk was not related solely to the three intermediaries, but in relate, but was instead um, an issue which arose. Uh, which arose because of the continuing legacy of relying on ELS. I understand how you've got to this premise, but if you read um, the second point and the third point, everything in our world was related to get funding for global asset finance. Can I take? Can I tender that, please, Your Honour? Exhibit 1.153 will be Minutes Operating Risk Executive Committee ANZ 12 February 18, ANZ 800 128 uh, 0424. Can I take you to... Uh, Just before we leave that document. Please. And I, can, I can clarify that point. Well... Uh, you want to add something, do you? What do you want to add, Mr Mendelson? Oh, well, that my recollection of this was at the time that the risk for our business was taken from, uh, from high to extreme related to uh, the three introducer fraud. It had nothing to do with uh, what you're alleging. Well, um, I draw your attention to the second dot point under paragraph one, in particular, the last sentence of that second dot point. I understand. Can we just break it up a little so that I can understand what it is telling me? The extreme risk acceptance was endorsed at Group RIC in May 2017, and the risk acceptance was approved to 31 October 17. So, Pausing there for the moment, a risk is noted as extreme, the risk is accepted with a limitation of time. 
Is that a Correct. fair Correct. understanding that's of what fair, I'm being told there? That's a fair understanding. And uh, the, the limitation and acceptance was dependent on funding for the GIF program, is that right? Yes. The, as I said to you, since I arrived in the business and before, uh, the whole premise of this business was to get consumer asset finance onto the GAF program. Yes. In particular, the extreme risk acceptance was not tied in this document in any respect to the outcome uh, of dealings with ASIC, whether in respect of the three introducers or otherwise, was it? Again, I, I'm, I'm not well versed in this document, uh, but my understanding uh, was that in working with uh, the risk department that we agreed that the businesses, we were the only extreme risk in ANZ at the time. And that was related to the ASIC investigation. That is my understanding. Um, I've, as I said, I understand where you, what the wording says, but that is my understanding. Yes. I'm going to take. You are about to move elsewhere. Which where? related to this issue, if I may, can <coughs> I go to ANZ.800.315.1639? What's this document, Mr. Mr. Mendelson? Uh, I believe this this is the Chief Risk Officer's report to the ANZ Board. So this is uh, the Chief Risk Officer's when he attends to the, the board of the company? Uh, I don't know if it, when he attends or if he just has to uh, provide it to the board. I assume when he goes to the board he presents his, but I, so I, this I don't document, know this for a fact. This document makes its way to the board I assume a reference, I know it's not your document, but for noting um, indicates that it's a matter that goes to, um, is it the risk committee of the board? Again, I can't comment, I don't know. I, it's I, either to the board or a committee of, of the, the board. board. Yes, correct. Yes, thank you. Um, can I take you to point 1647, please? Australia Division has undertaken a number of initiatives in recent years to reduce operational and compliance risk within the asset finance business, e.g. change commission structures, improve forward controls and enhance governance monitoring of brokers. They're all the things we've discussed today, aren't they? Uh, yes. However, continued reliance on ELS as a legacy system raises potential risks due to its limited connectivity to other ANZ systems and inherent complexity. That's what, I, that's what I outlined before. Do you yes. Do you want to revisit your evidence as to why this part of the business will be halted on the 30th of April? I'm not quite sure what you mean by that because I said, I said previously that the entire premise for this has always been that we needed to have connectivity, as it says there, to, um, to ANZ systems. So I'm not sure the point you're trying to make. The point I'm trying to make is that there hasn't been connectivity to other ANZ systems in inherent... Uh, sorry, my point is there has been limited connectivity to ANZ systems during the relevant period and beyond, hasn't there? Yes, with the express understanding from the organisation that we would... Uh, we, there would be a, a period of time where it would be acceptable uh, and if we didn't meet those deadlines that we would... We, we no longer could uh, operate the business, and that's where we've got to. And couldn't operate the business because there was a risk related to responsible lending. That's one of the considerations, yes. I know I said that in previously. Yeah, uh, look, uh, I, I just want to be sure of... Absolutely, uh, but it's, it, I just want to be clear. I, are you saying that you think we're closing the business because we're not meeting our responsible lending obligations? I'm asking you the question, Mr Mendelson. I'm saying... The reason for ANZ halting that part of the business as of the 30th of April is that which is set out here. That is that the continued reliance on the ELS system raises potential risks in relation to responsible lending. So 
So if you define responsible lending as making sure that you engage the customer and that they, their, their needs and objectives are being met, that you then get financial information to uh, be able to uh, ensure that the, the facility that you are giving them, y you've got the right information and then you verify it so it's not an unsuitable loan. EOS has been able to do that. Um, the, the issue around this is that if you want to be competitive in this marketplace, you need, find, you need to find ways to do that better than the way that we are doing it currently. And um, some of the information that we want to collect to enhance our responsible lending uh, practice is not just in, in what we're doing here, but right across the bank, will not be able to occur because there will be changes. The challenge that if you're not integrated into the main part of the bank is that you will not keep up with the pace of change that is occurring. So as we continually evolve the business, if we're not integrated, we will get left behind and there will be a chance that we will create greater problems later down the track. So I, I just want to be really clear that we are, it is a consideration, but it's not the reason. And uh, that y if you take responsible lending as those key points, um, we are, you know, we've had some deficiencies in our processes, but you know, as I've explained today, we've done an enormous amount of work because our, our, our philosophy and our approach was we would always get funding and we would continue to participate in this part of the market. But not growing your business is not something that would constitute a risk, is it, that would be reported by the Chief Risk Officer to the Board? Not growing your business? Yeah. If your business was starting to stagnate... Oh, no, no, no. It's not a risk issue. It's not a risk issue. Not a risk issue at all. But it's a, it's, the point is that if we've made some decisions in certain parts of the way that we operate not to get scaled because we're uncomfortable that the system is not scalable and as the world changes at furious pace, if you don't have a, a good digital offering, and remember I'm, we're deal AOS is a system that got launched in 1982 um, and it, it's just, you, we won't have a business and if we continue to not be integrated even if we kept at the same uh, size of business that we have today and we weren't integrated into the ANZ systems, the ANZ systems will get updated and we will be in the dark ages and we will put more risk into the bank and that is, that is the truth of the rationale of the decision. So I, I, I appreciate how you get to this by looking at some of the wording but that is the fundamental rationale for the decision. It is all, since I arrived in the business as I've said on numerous occasions it was of all the things that we were dealing with, this global asset finance system getting it into, um, into, uh, into uh, the consumer asset finance part onto it was, was mission critical number one. And you know, there's a whole team of people in ANZ who want to continue this business, but if we can't get funding and there are other priorities for the organisation, well then a, a decision will be made later in the year what we do moving forward. the system was good enough to continue to operate during the whole of 2017 when there was an extreme risk related to responsible lending? Again, I would like, is it possible yes or no, Mr. Minister? I've answered what I understand the rationale for the extreme risk was. Um, I would like, is it possible for me to, uh, as I said, my understanding of what the extreme risk was, was related to the ASIC investigation. It had nothing to do with, with ELS. I, I think, at least I understand that that's how you want me to understand the documents. My difficulty, so that, and I think we've grappled with it enough, but if we haven't, this is your chance. I don't see in the documents I understand about that. that. I understand that. You tell me that I should read them through the lens of the th three intermediary ASIC investigation, is that right? I'm here under oath. I'm yes. telling you what I believe is the truth. Uh, um, a lot of these documents, even working in the business, I'm not privy to. I don't attend this, um, but that has always been my understanding. If there's something different, I'm happy to come back and clarify that. Yeah. 
have nothing further. Yes, thank you, Mr. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, does anyone other than ANZ seek leave to cross-examine? No. Dr Collins? Yes, thank you, Commissioner. Mr Mendelson, are you a member of the Operational Risk Executive Committee? No. Uh, were you a party in any respect to the decision to increase the risk rating for asset finance for too extreme? Uh, I wasn't party to... Oh, well, so to be clear, my understanding, I was told by the Australian Risk Officer that that was her desire and I, I didn't push back on it. Okay. Um, in answer to a question from the Commissioner, you said that one of the problems with um, interactivity between the ELS and the broader ANZ system was that the wider ANZ system has sophisticated new credit systems. Can you explain what you meant by that? Uh, yeah, it, uh, we have invested an enormous amount of money uh, as an organisation in upgrading all of our uh, credit operating systems from acquisition um, and including the collection system. So they uh, are far more accurate, far more efficient and um, I'm not well versed in exactly what they do but it's been a major um, project that's been going on for quite a few years and uh, we were always uh, as part of the GAF program, we were all the expectation was that we would be integrated into those systems. Are you able to put a rough dollar figure on the investment in the uh, sophisticated new credit controls in the wider ANZ system? Uh, it would be my estimate would be it would be well over a hundred million dollars, if not greater. And, and to what extent, if at all, do those sophisticated new credit systems relate to responsible lending uh, obligations? Well, in my understanding of responsible lending, as I outlined before, they uh, will make it more efficient, but it will not... Uh, it, it, we, we still will, you know, we still are within our obligations as we are with the ELS system, but it will, it will make the efficiency of executing that far greater and will allow the business to scale, as I said previously. More efficient and more accurate or just more efficient? Uh, I think it... Potentially, uh, more accurate. Uh, more efficient, more accurate. I, I can't comment um, more accurate. I'm not well versed enough in the systems to give you a, a really a, an honest answer. Yes. Um, Mr Mendelson. Sorry, we can take you to the limits of your knowledge. We can't take you beyond that, Mr Mendelson. Yes. Um, Mr Mendelson, the Commissioner asked uh, a question about um, the typical dealer contracts um, uh, which explain the remuneration structure within a sander during the period of the um, frauds that you've given evidence about. Um, I wonder if the operator could display ANZ.800.159.1151 I might just say for the transcript I'm instructed this is a document that was produced in response was it been, with other documents to uh, notice to produce NP007. Um, are you familiar with the, this form of document, Mr Mendels? Uh, no, I'm not because I never worked in the dealer business. Uh, I might have to do what Mr Sheehan did yesterday. Uh, can I ask, can the operator swap scroll? Places, Dr Collins, swap places with the witness, we'll be right. <laughs> yeah, go on. <laughs> we'll see how I go. Uh, could the operator go to the bottom of the page? Hmm. Yeah, there should be a footer at the, bo footer at the bottom of that page. Hmm. Um, does that assist you? Do you recognise it as a document from the ANZ system, Mr Mendelson? Truthfully, no. Can I ask the operator to go to the next page? <laughs> and you see it's a document now headed dealer agreement, a Sander dealer agreement, uh, Australia and New Zealand Banking Group Limited. Have you seen documents like that before? 
are not dealer agreements, no. I can't take this any further. No, can I, the, the, the point of my inquiry, Dr Collins, so that you can uh, at least point me in the right direction is I want to see the term or terms that governed uh, things like flex commission, dealer origination fees, those issues. This document does all of that, and yeah. I, I, can um, I can take you through it if that assists Commissioner, well, but I would only be doing I it from the I just need to be table. pointed at what you say. Uh, yeah. I, let's cut to the chase. Um, I need to know whether ANZ accepts that this was a document typical of the time, uh, whether ANZ uh, can point to uh, the terms that uh, governed a point, um, uh, charging of flex commissions and the like. Now, uh, the witness can't help you. I understand that and we need to go as far as we can with the witness uh, to get him to the point of being released. So you might take those questions on notice and tell me immediately after the adjournment. This is that the most convenient way of dealing with convenient. it? Now, is there anything else you need to deal with with Mr Mendelssohn? No. Is there anything that arises, Mr Donnelly? Uh, no, Your Honour, other than a slip on my part not to have tendered the last document. Uh, I'll come back and uh, deal with that. That will be Exhibit 1.154. Uh, Chief Risk Officer Report 21 February 18, uh, ANZ 800 315 1639. Uh, we will come back and deal with the dealer contracts. There's nothing else then we need of Mr Mendelssohn, is there, I think? No, Commissioner. Mr Mendelssohn, thank you for uh, giving evidence. You're excused further attendance. Uh, it's almost precisely one o'clock if I come back at two o'clock. Is that? Yes. We'll adjourn until two.